Hello and welcome to the Believe live stream. My name is Cade and today is a very special episode. It is an extended live show tonight. I'm joined by some very special guests and let me introduce them to you. Today, the AYR crew made the trip up from the Gold Coast hinterland all the way up to sunny slash soggy Cairns, which is uh, just a bit of a wet, damp mess, which I think half of Queensland is at the moment. But let me introduce you to the guys. I am joined by the main man himself, Mr. Dean Harrison. Thank you. Okay, great to be back here. I think I was here, I think the end of... Oh, it's about the end of October, early November, my last trip. And then we got hit by COVID, so I couldn't make a return the next month. Yeah, there was a couple of roadblocks that kind of just got in the way for us. Uh, the uh, the great man himself, Buck, over to the other side, who uh, has captured possibly the world's best uh, Yowie footage of all time, in which we will uh, cover that a little bit later on on tonight's show. And, of course, the finder himself. Hello, yeah. Cade. How are you, mate? Good buddy yourself. Very good. It is. I, this is a real treat for me because this is the first time meeting the the two gentlemen on the couch in person. So uh, I've been fambling all afternoon, but it's the same on this side of the fence, mate. Oh, it's yeah, don't all, come on this side of the fence. <laughs> <laughs> you blushing, might not leave. Blushing all round. So, guys, in all in all honesty, it's it's a real treat to have you here tonight because there's there's only a handful of. I would say communities like ours in Australia where not all of them really talk to each other. There seems to be a lot of hostility in the world of the, in the world of Yowie, Bigfoot, paranormal UFOs, but uh, that's not the case, you know, with, with us, you know, we're very much, I like to think we're like a family unit, you know, we're, we're a very close knit community. And I think we all act as a team. We all big each other up, which is a rare thing in this world, I think at the moment. Yeah, well, we in particular, I mean, we're, we're all very close and you know, I think we get along with most other groups. Uh, well, I think, big, well, we are the largest, of course, and um, a lot of people come to us for advice and uh, basically, uh, yeah, just friendship. Basically, we're just here for, for the people, for the community. Uh, the amount of people that contact us and come to us at AYR, a lot of them don't want as so, so much to be famous or tell the story. They want to be in, in, in a safe space uh, and the age doesn't matter, the, per, the, the personality doesn't matter, the, 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 the field of work they're in doesn't matter. When they have these experiences, they feel so out of place uh, for a taboo subject, which as we know, it's becoming less of a taboo subject, it's becoming the normal subject. Uh, but yeah, they, they, there's people there, they, they want to speak to someone who understands them and is, is happy to listen to them without ridicule. Uh, even the fact of like uh, fathers contacting us uh, because their nine-year-old daughter had a sighting on a school trip. So they come to us asking if we can speak to their daughter just so their daughter knows that they're not crazy, they're not seeing things, that they don't have to feel weird and out of place. Yeah, it's – what you do is I think it's a, it's a real – real justice to the community because who who do you go and talk to about this well stuff? you see this this was the thing when first well when i first started basically uh back in 97 or well, 95 but then 97 that was the kicker um now it was a very dramatic encounter i'm sure you all agree and i searched for answers and there was nobody available back in those days and as i always say that was the embryonic stages of the internet so there was nothing online back in those days there's nothing in libraries uh, so I had no one to fall back on, and that was one of the key reasons AYR was formed. Yeah, it's and you really were one of those, probably still are one of those main outreach areas for for people. When absolutely, it comes to this. we are absolutely. I mean, basically, it, it's uh, all day, every day. People are emailing us or messaging us, whether it be Facebook or or whatever whatever platform that we're on. Even, yeah. even the fact that we just go for coffee somewhere, and if we're in the right location. And we are wearing a Yowie Hunters T-shirt, singlet, um, some kind of clothing. Uh, we generally do have a lot of people that will come up to us say, are you guys part of those Yowie Hunters? Yeah, yeah, we're wearing the T-shirts, of course. And, oh, yeah, okay, cool. So down the road, last week on Tuesday, uh, this thing stepped out, roared, daughter. Uh, so it's, again, it's p people of all walks of life, they, they need someone to talk to. And that's exactly, why we're here. and and we, we are very 
well recognised as well. I mean, I can be driving down the street, people are tooting or waving or taking photos. Your car has Yowie as a number plate, so <laughs> it does help. It's a big it black help. beamer with Yowie as a number but, plate. You know, having you know, had people waiting uh, in car parks. Uh, uh, if I've got, gone for a run, people are still waiting back at the car. Yeah. I've done a seminar on Bowers of Three at my local Shell service station for a group of American <laughs> tourists. But, so, you know, people like talking about it. Uh, and when they, they see us, well, they, they often take that opportunity. So what's been going on this year? We're in a whole new year. Uh, last year was a gangbuster year for, for AYR. And uh, the the footage that you captured last year, groundbreaking. The man himself over there. We captured it like it's it was a team effort. I wouldn't have been out there if these guys hadn't have done the hard yards and found the location, and gradually put a camera in my hand that's worth a mint to go out and you know try and get something. And it just it happened. It happened. We've been practicing trying to get this situation to. Uh, eventuate for many many trips and then when it does it it it's amazing suddenly you have something it's six seconds of something that is just um you look back on that night and you go wow uh if we did do this work i wouldn't be here at this moment with these great people getting this footage yeah isn't it about 13 14 seconds uh you sound like someone I know. It, it was a, it was a <laughs> huge year for us. It was one of the biggest years ever, and uh, it wasn't the only footage we got that year either. Uh, there's a lead up to that point uh, that we got to that, so that stage we we got to where we obtained that footage. But we'll get to all that later. Uh, basically, right up until December, we were active, and then I think December, uh, January, we had most of that time off until the 29th of uh, January, where we filmed the track documentary with uh with, with dan attila attila, attila, yeah. attila and yeah we do yeah yeah I'm really shout out to that. yeah attila till is a really good friend of mine and massive like massive supporter of the show and um the the work that is going to that he's putting into this second documentary is astronomical like it is huge i've i've been speaking to him for years about the the second one and the he basically started it as soon as the, the first one was finished. The first one did very well, particularly in America. Yeah, yeah. And it is it is a, an incredible documentary. He is a, 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 an amazing uh, filmmaker and uh, he, he has a real love for the craft. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what comes in season, no, it's not season two, <laughs> um, in the second documentary because you guys are featured in it. Yeah. I'm featured in it. Um, the footage is featured in it. The footage, yeah. So it's. I think it's going to really shake up the the whole Yowie world. Interestingly, when when they uh, they came up and they were staying in a chalet in Springbrook, uh, they had they did they had some activity while they were at Springbrook. So yeah, I think it was uh, Dan Yowie Dan uh, saw something off in the darkness, but they they did they didn't have the thermal camera out at that stage. Uh, but there's still enough light that they could see through the through the through, through the forest a little bit, and there was a large figure moving through the trees. Uh, and then later that night, Dan is just trying to sleep. Attila, I think, may have been asleep, and something was banging on the side of the cabin. And the next morning, when the AYR team arrived to start the filming of track two, uh, Shannon went for a walk. Shannon Guthrie. And he came across the typical Springbrook signifier, which is the sticks jammed in the ground. Um, again, when we're not talking about twigs, we're talking about quite large inch to two inch thick sticks, branches, uh, jammed in the ground, four to six inches in the ground. And that was the start of their adventure into Springbrook, which is, you know, as we all know, one of the main hotspots in Australia. That, that night they had the banging on the walls yeah. and, the, and the, yeah, the, the doors and things that they couldn't explain. And I think they both may have seen that silhouette standing in they the did. darkness. They did. So, I mean, that was a, a good start for them on, on that night. They were quite excited about that. Uh, then we went out to the location uh, out, well, before, beforehand. I'll just run a couple of photos just of this, um, just of the, uh, the, the filming of the, uh, just, bring those, just bring that up there. Uh, that's the yeah we down. That's the tiller in the background, and of course Gary there. 
and Buck being in, Buck being interviewed. There's, there's Shannon there, Gary, and uh, that was that. And there's uh, Al and, and so on. And then when we went out to location, we this is again this is at Witherin, and this is where Glenn Kilmartin had the incident with the truck. Uh, where it came up and hit the truck. Now, the circumstances with this is what well, most people already know. Uh, it's come out, well, it's airborne, uh, off an embankment, lands on the road, he's locked the truck up, slides towards it, stops just in time, and this thing gets up and he walks over and he hits the truck. Uh, I think what, what Glenn said was it's a, he likened it to hitting a small Mazda Mazda 3. That was the, the power and the force of you know, of this hitting it. But on the other side of the road, where it went to, this is interesting. Now, if you have a look at this, that is basically a – this thing leapt the fence. Now, there's no trees around on either side of this cyclone fence to have done that damage. And that is almost like a hand forcing that down. And that would take a great amount of force. Correct. It's basically like following the dots. Uh, so where these beings come off one side of the road and then to the point of access to the other side of the road. So this, this is army land. So land that's not for public access. Uh, come off one side of the road from, from, from army land on one side, jumps down onto the road, stands up, palm punches the front of the truck, heads off the other side of the road to where you can see Shannon uh, inspecting the fence there. So again, it's just connecting the dots and trying to understand their movements and where they're going and trying to understand basically what they get up to and the, the ranges of locations that they may be calling home. So looking at this, you guys see evidence like this probably all the time. And I, I would imagine there would kind of be this re reenactment process that kind of plays through your head. Looking at this, this kind of looks like this, this creature would have just bound over the top of it, put its hand on it and potentially bound over the top. Well, according to Glenn, it was at least nine feet tall. Now, he was in a truck, a big truck, like a real truck. Mm. And now he had to lean right down and look up through the windscreen yeah. 45 degrees to see the top of its head. And that's a big creature. Now, if it was that large, you could imagine that would be – what we're looking at here would be pretty much just like a hurdle, one hand down, straight over the top. And imagine how agile these creatures are. Well, you've got to think, like, I mean, with, with the size of these beings, the, the gait, so the gait being from one footstep to the next, uh, for, for, for ourselves, you know, we're, we're talking about half a metre to a metre between our gait, again, our, our, our footstep to our footstep. These beings being nine foot tall, potentially, uh, that gate's going to be up to three metres. So something of, of, with that gate of that height is going to quite easily uh, leap a six, seven-foot fence with no issues. Yeah, in um, 1999, I was um, on the set of a short film, and the short film, the uh, Land Warfare Centre at Kanungra kindly said we could use their jungle training area to do this short film that was set in World War II and, you know, they've got a Viet Cong uh, base out there with tunnels. So it just kind of fit. But they said with your gear that you leave there, you're going to have to have someone to look after it for three days, and that was me. So I stayed out there for three days by myself when everybody went home and I had an experience much earlier when I was younger, but I put the whole Yowie thing, I didn't even know about them until I met Dean, but uh, I wanted to phone my wife and I had to uh, trek out through uh, perhaps about two kilometres of bush and there's a dirt track. And on the way out, I, I felt a little uneasy and I looked around and I thought I saw something huge just sit down. Now, this was ages ago, uh, ages before I met Dean, and I just went, oh, what is that? And now, having known that, I would love to be able to go back for three days to that location and just have the thermal there it would just be amazing. 
Yeah, but there's mate, something on, on on saying that though, being that particular base, mm. as you know, we've spoken to people uh, who have dealings with that base, including security and that kind of thing. Who there's certain areas of this base where the security will not go to, for the main reason that they're sick of going and checking this gate or going up this road. Uh, they they're sick of being screamed at when they go down this track, well, yeah, or yeah, they're they're, yeah. they're sick they're sick of the back of the car being slapped. Wow. When they go up these, well, get these this. Um, they gave me a radio and they told me I had to radio in every hour on the hour uh, up until about midnight. And then this, is, to- this is basically because Buck gets lost a lot. That's the yeah. real reason for this. <laughs> yeah, I tried tree mail <laughs> and telegram. Anyway, I, I um, so, yeah, they, they gave me a radio. I had to radio in every hour after people left after five. Uh, they didn't want to do it, and I thought that was really odd. You know, I was going just out here in the bush, and you know, little did I know that uh, there was something big and hairy out there. There's reasons. There's reasons, but yeah, they were really adamant. I had to take this radio, and I had to uh, um, radio them on the hour until midnight, and then at six in the morning, say I'm alive, and I was going, why? <laughs> because we love you, Buck. <laughs> Yeah, that's, you know, there there has to be, honestly, a duty of care in a situation like that, though. Because what happens what happens if you just go missing? Do you just become a missing person then? Well, I think in that situation, he would go disappear. He would become a dis. I can't talk yeah. right now. <laughs> well, He'd you know, be that person that would disappear. <laughs> I've, I've, I've nearly become out. one of those missing people myself on more than one occasion, and it's only – fact that I was in fortunate situations um, that I'm still here now and I have absolutely no doubt as I always say that uh, I, I truly believe that these are responsible for many many missing people yeah because there's for me why would you have to radio in every hour I don't know I just did the job the job was you know okay look after the gear and I was thinking why wow, this is kilometers you have to go through uh a locked fence onto the Land Army Warfare Center, and I'm here. You know, uh, why do I have to do it uh, on the hour? Anyway, I did do that, and I just I followed orders. I yeah. didn't ask questions. No, fair I enough. Radio they they were doing this solid because um, our location had fallen through, and suddenly we got this great location. And um, uh, yeah, I just had to do that for three days. But yeah, the the creature or whatever I thought I saw. I went, you know, I was taken aback because there was a tree line, there was some big grass, it was a moonlit night, I didn't have a torch, and um, I, I didn't have a reason to be scared. You know, you can feel uneasy, and I was just going, oh, I want to phone my wife, I have to walk. This is the day when you actually had to get two 20-cent pieces and put them in the phone and go, I love you, oh, cut off. Um, so I had to walk out to make that trek and then realise um, – you know, someone ripped the handle off the uh, <laughs> off the telephone. Well, it's, it's such a notorious area, and it has has quite a history over like decades, basically. It does. I mean, like that for, for, again for that that particular base, there's been uh, operations in there where a, a, a team leader has put in place a protocol where he goes off by himself, and the rest of the team have to track him through this base. Yeah, and it goes for about three days, and. For those three days, that particular team leader noted something following him the whole time. It had stayed just out of light, uh, just out of firelight, or just at a range that he couldn't quite get a grasp on it. But he definitely saw an object, a being, something following him through the bush, and it stayed with him for three days. And again, this this area backs into, as you know, a particular mountain which has a lot of activity. Yeah. I feel like this is a rabbit hole that we could continue down for, yes. for hours and hours because it sounds like a very hot spot. But I can see you have so much more that we need to chat about. So what happened in February, Dean? Well, February, uh, we had uh, – well, when was, when was Scat Creek? That was we, earlier last year. That is behind yeah. you. Oh, earlier last year. <laughs> That's not him doing it, though. That's Gary's cleavage. Gary didn't do it. Dean didn't really pick a very flattering <laughs> good, good picture for the right <laughs> Earlier last year, we made a trip to a place called Nunnambar Valley uh, at a place that we now call Scat Creek for a very good reason. 
uh, we set off very early in the morning. The night before, it had been raining torrentially, very, very heavy rain. And I think it had been raining for days prior to that. And uh, so 8 o'clock in the morning, roughly, we'd enter down into this valley. And it's a place that nobody really goes. It's, it's not very heavily trekked. And it's basically just thick bush. And es Especially the second half where Scat Creek got its name from. It's very thick up that way. So yeah, it's not a destination point. It's not something on a bucket list. It's, it's not a walking track. It's not somewhere people go on weekends for a hike. Uh, so we're pretty remote out in the bush in this area. And we'd also split up there at one stage and Gary had gone down into the creek itself. And the water levels at this stage, they dropped. Um, in the, the coming out the coming out of the prior hours, they would have been quite high. They've dropped down just below the rock line by this stage. And as you'll see from the video here, uh, this is what we discovered. On a rock in the middle of the creek. Bring this up. Technical issues. I'll just I'll just bring that back a bit. <laughs> so um when you wake up in the morning and you decide we're going out on an expedition yes Cade. <laughs> yes is um is yeah we scat yes Cade. yes on on the mind is it on the hit list and <laughs> i guess how do you prepare for that Okay, so what you want to do is you crouch over in the push-up position. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, definitely had a very unique smell that certainly woke it you up. It had a bouquet all about it. It, 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 was, it, was, it was far more than that. It was atrocious. It was the worst smelling whatever it was. It's like something I had never smelt before. It was not human, believe me. It was you not You barely human. smelt it. What are you talking yeah. about? I didn't need to. I was that far away. I, was, I did the, the hard yards, I was he away. did the second hard yards, and you were yeah. over here complaining about it. You had nosebleeds afterwards. Uh, I still I do. lugged it out. Remember, I put it in my backpack, and I lugged it out. So I, th I think I think <laughs> <laughs> what we're trying to say, it was pretty bad. It was pretty rank, and it was, it was, a, it was a different type of smell. It's not something that you would uh, associate with a dog or a human. It no. was something very, very different. Um, so 
as I said right in the end there, I said, well, let's bag that and get that tested. So we did, uh, with help from a, an academic friend of mine, uh, somebody in, in that industry, who was very helpful to us. He uh, came and had a meeting with us and, and took that away, put it in the freezer, and he took it to the DPI, the New South Wales DPI. Now, what they do in these situations is they, they test for a couple of different things. They'll test for the foliage. So they'll, they'll have charts of known animals, what they eat, et cetera, et cetera. So basically a go-to book of, okay, we found this, what eats this, da, da, da. And they'll go through all these different charts and nine times out of ten, they'll match it up with a normal native Australian animal. In this case, they couldn't. It didn't match anything. So strike one, that was good. Now, the second one is what they call an egg count. Now, Oh, what? so this is kind of like the the natural flora in a in a in a stomach, isn't That's right. it? Right, not, not Easter eggs. And yeah. and again, you know, they have these charts of egg counts or uh, what 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 they want to call them, uh, and basically, anything that's low to the ground has a higher count because worms, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they have the pods, and so you can get tens of thousands of these worms in normal. Uh, native animals and these and then basically the only animals mammals on this earth that won't have much of this will be either an ape or human now something like a dog for example is low to the ground and you know what dogs are like they'll eat pretty much anything off the ground so they would have a pretty high um, pod count now these came up with nothing no pods didn't make any sense. So the diet didn't match and the pod count, which was just astounding, didn't match. Right. So this is really exciting for everybody, everybody, and, and, and the person who was organising this also. So the next stage was the DNA, the DNA test. Now, you can see the size of that scat sample. It wasn't small. It was quite large. Roughly about six, six inches in length was that bigger piece. Now, this had to go from Lismore down to Sydney uh, during COVID. Now, we had to keep it at a certain temperature on the way down. Now, it arrived there and it had its testing. And I got an email back on the, four, on the 14th of the 3rd. And it basically says here, uh, insufficient DNA found, which is quite remarkable considering the size of it when it says insufficient does that mean it's unable to be matched to anything on record well you see this is the thing now our host here who's who's been organizing all this uh, and he's quite the expert on in this field uh, his his take on this he says to me it's come back to us with insufficient host dna our contact who arranged this idea, oh, okay, yeah. So unfortunately, they are claiming that there was not enough host DNA to give us an accurate identification. It was a substantial stool amount. So my best guess is that it, they simply couldn't identify it or it was left out of the freezer for too long. I'd probably go because we, we made sure that it was in the freezer and it was, it was dealt with properly. So I'd go back to number one and say they couldn't identify it. And if you know any academics like we do, you know that they, um, when it comes to things like this and they can't answer things, then they'll just say, well, but they'll pass it on to you. That was a problem. Yeah. It doesn't fit the, yeah, the narrative. They, they, so they didn't know. They didn't know, basically. Yeah, but the whole stool also didn't fit the narrative mm. because, as Dean said, it had been raining torrentially up until about 3 a.m. the previous night. So that's when it stopped, and now we have this great big. Um, it was new, new. The stool that Gary found, uh, because we're out there looking for stuff, and we've transported it out. So it would mean that you know, if, if it was a human, it was someone at three a.m. Yeah. Uh, and it, I can tell you, it didn't smell like a human. We I broke a little bit open, and we found tiny bones, and of, we dry reached. We dry retched a lot, absolutely. I carried that on my back and it just felt like um, Mike Tyson giving me an uppercut to the nose. So really there's a small window there where 
it would have been laid. Now, why in the middle of the creek? I don't know. And I hear a lot of scat encounters near creeks. Scat encounters. Yeah. <laughs> Here comes another <laughs> one. <laughs> oh, it's a giant walking scat. They're um, everywhere. They're everywhere. But it, it, it seems to be. Ho. <laughs> but you know seems, what I'm talking about. <laughs> it seems to be a, um, I don't know, like a, a, a common place for for this to happen. Well, we we have we have had a lot of uh, reports come in uh, potential Yowie scat down by creeks, and when you think about it, uh. Going into a creek, washing yourself once you're done. Yeah, it yeah. makes sense. Uh, yeah, yeah. Cats, dogs, deer, they don't care if they if they, if they're in a location, they're going to go there. It doesn't matter. They might sniff around a bit, but they're not going to make the effort to cross a creek, stop at a rock in the middle of a creek. Like like the th- the thing is where where this scout was found. It, it it wasn't an easy access walk. You are literally stepping stones to cross the creek. So something something has step stones stopped in the middle one done its business and carried on mm. not particular cat and dog or deer no, behavior it, it, it yeah. shows there's an intelligence yeah. to there, the decision there, being made there, there is and i sort of put it to you know if it's something that's it's used to well particularly the water running as fast as it was uh, chances are that it's going to be washed away right so there's going to be no trace of it number one number two is that they're in the position where they can clean themselves with water, using the water, and again, as you say, it's uh, intelligence. Uh, and with those those two in mind, and plus the the time factor, I think it's no. I think I think we have, we're in for a pretty good chance there. And have a look at the the um, the, um, the test results. Yeah, I think it's I think it's very very telling. So another thing is it was just down the it was just down the hill basically from where we took the footage. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah, the, yeah. The, the thing is, yeah. So, so the, the yeah. area is na- active, Correct. and we also found footprints. Well, the thing is, we, we, with this particular area of Scat Creek, we we found symbols. We found big the the the, the, the typical X markers, like quite big ones. Uh, we've had mumblies, mumblers. So a mumbling vocal up the creek. Buck went to investigate where this mumble was. He heard something move off through the bush. Uh, we've had other strange vocals. We've had other strange. Tree knocking type sounds. Tell 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 what happened with with the uh, Bucks radio. Oh yeah, how strange. And this is this that is in the same high strangeness. The same creek. The same creek. Same creek. Uh, was it the same day? Was Tony with us? No, no. Well, this is yeah. the this is the, 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 the second the, visit. The radio was the second visit. That correct. was that was fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Carry on. Oh yeah. Okay. Um. He uh, he he forgets easily. I do. I forget. Who are you? I don't know. Okay. All right. <laughs> are you a friend? I don't know. Um, I was um, uh, trekking out of Scat Creek and uh, I brought a brand new radio. I had an earpiece. No, I didn't have an earpiece. And I, um, uh, I'd just taken it out of the box because Dean's all about protocols and us not getting lost and I'm his liability because he doesn't want to have to face my wife and say, yeah, we've lost him again. And uh, so I've got the radio on my hip and i've got it on my uh the right uh part of my hip and i get up to the uh car which is this heavy slog up this huge hill and i look down and i don't have it i don't have my radio and it's um switched off and I'm well, s- uh, well uh, just, yeah. just to cut in sorry at, at this point uh, all the radios were switched off because we regrouped and we're heading out. So when, we, when we've regrouped, we turn the radios off, save battery. Again, we, we don't need the radios because we're back together. And so I've gone, that's it. I've blown 140 bucks. Um, a bit down on myself. And someone says, let's go back and look for it. I'm thinking, where? Where can I? Are you like, that's a, that's a Montrous ravine that we've uh, trekked out. I don't think we'll find it because I, I can't recall when I last touched it. And um, so unbeknownst to me, two days later, after uh, a rainy night, um, Gary, the finder, this is where he gets his name, goes down and you can take over. <laughs> okay, so you basically I retraced our steps out of this gorge, out of the valley, uh, back down toward the creek. Uh, did the best I could. I luckily found the exact spot that we came out. 
And I was about probably about 10 metres from where I found Buck's radio and I heard this strange vocalisation and then straight after that was a, a very strange, like almost a metallic, <laughs> yes, there you go, a metallic, uh, it's actually very hard sound to describe, that came from the area where where, he, uh, where I was heading down to. I freaked out for a second, uh, just stood there quietly trying to collect my thoughts and listen. And uh, basically I continued on and what I came to found was Buck's radio uh, clipped to a vine at roughly my chest height. So I'm about six foot uh, and this radio was clipped to a vine. Now, common sense would tell you that he stepped on a vine. As he stepped on the vine, it's grabbed his radio and come up. Um, problem was this situation that wouldn't work. Now, when you take into consideration where his radio was clipped, this is – very close to where we had the mumbler. So if you picture an old man mumbling in the bush, a deep, heavy mumble uh, for about five to ten seconds. And again, as I said earlier, Buck took off up the creek to try and catch what it was mumbling and then heard something move off up the bush. And again, surrounded by symbols, surrounded by X markers, uh, surrounded by scat. And yeah, it's a very strange occurrence uh, finding your yeah. radio. And, and the thing, what you need to note as well that I just re- remembered, as Buck said earlier, he turned the radio off. When I found it, it was turned on. Makes what you happens? think, doesn't it? It does make you think because if it's a, a normal human being, I don't think they're going to clip it to a vine. That, that would just take it. Uh, they would just take it and they'd probably put it in a forum saying, hey, anybody lose the radio, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Also to where we were going. Here. And then the thing was as well, where we went, when we left this this creek, as we do, we pick a random location. There's no yeah. tracks, nothing. It's that way. So So it's really off track, isn't it's it? It's very much off yeah. track. It's 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 not it's not a it's not a used location. It's not a used trackway. Uh again, I defined where we came out. And I did so, and then his buck's radio clipped to a vine. And it's also clipped in a position that it wouldn't have been filched with a vine. Like, it, it's on backwards, if you can understand it. Like, it goes, clips in on my hip, and then it's facing completely the opposite way. And the clip's pretty strong. Um, and... Uh, I'm saying as well, even if, if vine did grab grab your radio, you would have felt it tug on the radio. I would have felt and it tug, yeah. And take it off. There was yeah. nothing. It just it dropped off and there it is hanging you know, 1,200, 1,400 mil off the ground. Yeah. Could and, um, that's why I'll name my first it, born again, the finder. Of. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Again, like this is this is below where Buck got those thermals. It's, yeah. it's, it all links up to itself. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Do you guys, and I'm, I'm kind of going on a very, very small tangent here, but do you guys plot the areas of activity on a map? Eh, well, Dean has lots <laughs> of pins and maps. D- because- Dean has an idea. Yeah. And we start with that idea. Yeah. And then that do- that idea gets left back there. And next thing you know, we're somewhere over there. Yeah. In, in all our photo <laughs> records, uh, because of geocaching, we can go back to where the photos were taken. Yeah. Uh, and obviously we see a lot of activity mainly because we're in that location and we're taking photos, so we know where we've been and this is where something happened. Uh, we do document very thoroughly as well. Yeah. Everywhere we go, everything we see, and we keep journals. We keep journals. I should, I, I, should, I should talk to you. We could probably look at building you a, a secret database that you can plot out your maps and find areas of of interest that's a all that's an, an offline here. discussion <laughs> okay but uh talking about the the whole digital side of things you guys have been making some moves in the digital world this year as well which i think is very exciting because dean you've entered my realm well well we've uh, we were starting to turn some of our witness reports into podcasts so by demand really popular demand uh, in the past we have done the youtubes or the witness audio reports on youtube we were the first in the world to actually do this prior to even YouTube existing. Uh, we were before the, before the Americans and 
anyone really. Uh, we were recording uh, Paul Cropper and Tony Healy re recording uh, since probably the early uh, 90s probably. So we had all that in our arsenal. And so we started doing that autonomously without any sort of platform that we have these days. Uh, so basically we've, we'd been doing all these, which are very, very popular of the witness audio reports. And then people were saying, well, we'd like to take this sort of this sort of thing with us, say, on a plane or somewhere out of reception, we'd be able to download it, et cetera. So now we've, we're starting to turn them all into podcasts. And, you know, it's, it's all work and uh, also keeping the data bus, the data bus, the data bus, the data it is a data bus. <laughs> Keep, keeping the database up to to uh, up to date is, is very very difficult when you when you're dealing with with all these these other aspects. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's just a, it's just such a busy time. We're busier now than we've ever been before, and we probably we probably need a little bit of help writing up some of these witness reports. Because that's something that not a lot of people would probably realise is that you've actually got a very small team. You know, I. I, I understand the difficulties of doing something that is quite large by yourself. And what you do is so much bigger than what I do. You know, at, at the end of the day, I, I produce great little episodes that, you know, people can share their encounters. But what you do is so much more. You're, you're going o out o there. Audio is one thing, but when you start putting images in. It's a whole other It's game. a whole new thing. And, and people, people almost expect it from us. And I have to say to them, sorry, but we're actually not a production team. This isn't what we're about. I mean, this is like a side thing that we sort of do if we have any spare time, but people are wanting us to do this as the main the main frame. Well, that's the thing, like when, when, when you've got that many hours that go into the, the production of making these these war reports, war witness audio reports, uh, Dean doing the audio, Sarah doing the audio, Buck, Buck is the one that does the amazing illustrations. Uh, but hey, I said thank you, don't and then putting like it all that. together. Oh, don't you talk to me? And like then, that. and then also on top of that, you know, you, yeah. you've you have to do the important thing, which is the database. I mean, that's what yeah. AYR is all about: is the database. This is, but again, trying to find the time when the, the, we, the time we, when you're out on expedition as well. We've got to find. We have, yeah. If you don't have the foot, the, the boots on the ground, you're not going to find. You know, the, and, these new breakthroughs. That's that, that, that's what I think a lot of people don't understand. They they think that we just go down a random track and hope we find something no 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 we are literally we're there for a reason yeah we, we're literally deep into the forest into the bush into the valleys into the gorges on the cliff faces hours and hours and hours to get in and then it's hours and hours to get back out and i just want to add something that you do this all out of your own pocket yeah you know you you don't make a cent from doing this and I think that's really important for people to know because, as, as Dean was saying there before, you know, there is an expectation of, well, why haven't AYR put out a new video or a new report? Or It's because or, we're lost. <laughs> we're, we're, we're lost <laughs> in the bush. still our bush. I lost my radio. Yeah. <laughs> but, the, but that's the thing is, like, you're, you're so busy doing everything else and, and you're doing this out of the love of the subject. It's, it's not cheap. It's expensive. Uh, just the AYR forum, for example, can cost us thousands of dollars a year, thousands of dollars yeah. to keep that up and running. Uh, then you've got the costs of the website and uh, then there's the operational gear, like there's the equipment and uh, doing the expeditions themselves. It's not cheap. Flying up to Cairns to do a podcast with our our dear friend here. Yeah, but it's, it's just yeah, lucky yeah. that Cade had his chauffeur pick us up from the airport. That's true. I mean, well, I, I sent big the thanks to jet. Jacinta. Jacinta, we loved it. Thank you for picking us up on the bicycle. <laughs> it was great. Isn't um, it? Took took it took a while, didn't it? <laughs> so basically, I mean, everything costs money. It, it's it's not cheap, uh, particularly if you like us and we like all the the latest equipment. Uh, anything's going to put us in the box seat, give us the best chance for the efforts that we make. And that's the thing. That's where you are making the difference. Is that the the investments that you are making are paying off. Well, that's the thing. It's not a blind investment. It's not no. just buying these, using this equipment for the hell of it. It's actually using it for a purpose and striving to achieve those results. And yeah. Dean's uh, been a weapon. At, a weapon. Now, he is a weapon, but he's also been uh, very, very generous with his money and his time, but also um, a willingness to push technology because while we have these new uh, guide infrared 
uh, sorry, these guide thermal cameras. He started off with a FLIR back in 2010. And the first thing he did was get, give it to a group of us in the Blue Mountains. And we used it uh, a lot while he was on business uh, overseas, you know, working really hard. And here we have the joy of using his thermal. And it was because of that aging thermal, uh, when you needed it the most, it was the, it the, 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 the new the thermal one. was on the other side of the hill. Yeah, we took some great pictures of uh, a still uh, billabong for yeah. you, Dean. There's some ducks. Um, there's, some ducks. Ni- there's some nice trees. A spider. Uh, there's a spider. Um, but where it was needed uh, on the other side of the hill uh, is when Dean had company. And he radios through, Gary, Gary, where are you? Oh, just with Buck having a chat, just looking at the pond. <laughs> It was magnificent. It reminded me of Monet's water lilies. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah. I mean, if we had had a picnic, it would have been perfection. And, and then uh, to, to, to cut to the point, uh, Dean had company. So we chose this ridge at a certain location. And Dean actually watched a being come down the hill, looking at him and then poking his head around the tree. And as Buck said earlier, uh, with the aging fleur, so – Again, aging, so it's the, the quality isn't up to spec as it used to be. And unfortunately, the, again, the new thermal was with myself and Buck on the other side. And if the roles w- were reversed, or I should say the cameras were reversed, Dean would have got some super amazing footage. He actually watched this being walk down the hill, stand behind a tree, poke its head out multiple times on either side of the tree, looking at him. I was saying that he did get a decent shot of eye shine of it poking his head around the tree. However, it poked around the tree multiple times, and then he physically watched this being walk back up the ridgeline. Uh, again, if, if the camera roll were, was reversed and he, he had the new thermal, um, that would have been groundbreaking footage. Yeah. I mean, basically, I had watched this walk down the hill. I could hear it walking bipedally. I could see it walking bipedally. Uh, the fleur, as you rightly say, was aging, uh, and it came down behind that tree. Now, before it went behind the tree, you could see the head and the shoulders, and it was standing there, and it stepped in behind the tree, then it put its head out, and it looks around, and it could see me on the other side of the valley. Now, how it could see me, I have no idea. We were totally stealth in pure pitch darkness and it's watching me his head goes back in behind it and comes back out again just like a human would standing like a human back in again back out again and then he turns around and he runs back off through the bush and if you look at that photo again uh you'll see me as a comparison shot um where you have the branch uh, above the eye shine see how close that uh, branch is uh above the eye shine wow that's that's yeah so you can see the the branch on the the right hand image there just above its head so that's buck on the left and you see how high that branch is so again just going back to that we don't just take random photos we actually do our best to actually scope out the area find the correct position the correct angle of the capture of the photo and try and match that up as best we can with what we've captured with that particular uh, being, we estimated that we're looking around about eight and a half foot tall. And uh, the other thing too is it matched out with uh, where Dean was. Like uh, it was the only time I've ever had to put a red circle around a human because Dean was very hard <laughs> to see in the daylight. He was he was hiding up there. He was hiding up there and cursing our names that um, we had the good uh, stuff. Yeah, but we were having a picnic. Yeah, we were making it's not art. Our fault. We were doing an art house. We film. were we were relaxing. Yeah, he was doing research. <laughs> we were making movies. <laughs> it's all part of being a Yowie hunter. Yeah, it is. And the the thing is, like to today, we've really only got a slither of the of the AYR crew. We've got we've got the boots on the ground here, but there's so many. There, there is quite a few more members of the of the AYR team that. Unfortunately, can't make it here tonight for just logistical reasons. Um, and uh, I haven't got enough seats. Anyway. That's the truth. We want them, but there's just only – I can only afford four seats. But, um, Dean, can you give us a rundown of the, the other team members that, uh, that, that you know, make a, make a real difference and play a real crucial role within your, in your crew? Okay. Well, we've got two of our 
uh, most special guys we've got here. That's Wade. Wade, Wade Matthews. Wade's a, he's, he's an, an outdoorsman, a bushman. Uh, he's very credible and very reliable. He's the real Russell Coit. He, he, he is. <laughs> Uh, and uh, he's he's ever reliable. He's the sort of guy that you really want on your team. Uh, good guy to have around. He oozes confidence, that's for sure. Very, very confident, and he knows his way around the Australian bush. He knows all of his uh, his native animals. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's a uh, yeah, good guy. Yeah, good guy. He knows how to string a hammock. And uh... <laughs> and then uh, this this is this is L L Newton. Uh, very enthusiastic. Uh, he's always there when needed. Yeah, it's, uh, Al, Al's, Al's very good, very uh, very happy to help. And uh, I think the first time that Al came out with us on a overnighter, we heard, we heard something creeping through the bush. So myself and Al crept down in, in this valley to uh, try and um, see what we could find um it, it did sound very curious what we we're looking going for so we spent about 40 minutes trying to be very stealthy and tiptoe where we we're going through had the thermal camera ready and the sounds that were coming out of the bush we were certain we had something we're, we're, we're creeping up on something I'm, i i won't lie i was thinking it's a yowie we, we we're creeping up on a yowie it sounded bipedal mm. here we go here we go here we go and we come up on it, it's a bloody bird dropping bark out of a tree. <laughs> yeah. So this yeah. is why you don't jump to conclusions straight away. And yeah, for all the anybody who thinks that we're in a, an echo chamber and we uh, just listen to what each other says, we will be critical and have critical analysis on what we found. And well, you have to, you have to. Yeah. Otherwise, everything's a yowie. Yeah. Every sounds a yowie. You can't do that. Yeah. If, if 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 we get a thermal image, we we come over the radio saying yes, we have something on thermal, but we do not say I have a yowie on thermal. Yeah, I would imagine that the the process is eliminate that it's rule out what it could be before yeah, saying what it is. Absolutely, hundred percent. You, you want to disprove everything that you can to say okay, it's everything. Buddy, yeah. Well, well things, that's why yeah. the radios are so important because yeah. uh, sometimes we'll have um, a heat signature that looks very convincing, and we will say, uh, "Wave your hand over your head." And uh, if that happens, we know we've picked up uh, another person. But that—that's why we cross-reference where people are, and we check out, um, you know, the signature before we jump to any wild claims. Just, just moving on to a. Just and another little segue here um the, the the reach that we all have that we don't realize out there on the internet or any of these platforms that we're on uh this is al this is on one of our expeditions here he'd gone into a, a camping store down in tweed heads uh to to get some gators for this this operation and just have a little listen do you want to make this one full screen Keegan? Yeah, so 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 basically, basically, uh, just stating there that he'd gone into the camping store, didn't know the guy, and the guy said, "Well, I was watching him believe." It's it's unbelievable the the people that you'll find that are actually into this stuff because something that that Gary said earlier is that you know it it doesn't matter who you are. Like these experiences, like they don't discriminate. They don't care if you're a lawyer or a doctor. No, they don't. A police officer, a fiery. Um, watch out for a fiery episode coming up on Believe. It will blow your mind. Um, Is it a live action show? No. <laughs> um, 
but that's that's just the thing, you know. You just don't know who's into this stuff and who the influence, who Everyone, you're influencing. Everyone's into it. It's yeah. With with a lot of it, if a lot a lot of people will, will will keep very quiet about it because they don't want to be ridiculed. But if they come across someone, hence A Y R, hence yourself, believe, and they they're going to be in a safe space and they'd be more inclined to talk about it. And again, as you said, like with with, with people of these professions, we have people in these professions of police, uh, science, science backgrounds, military backgrounds, contact us all the time. No, we can't tell you who they are, but they come to us all the time. Police have, have, have a yowie step out in front military of Military all levels. Correct. Parks uh, and wildlife. Scientists. Scientists who Academia. Know, yeah, yeah, who are very straight line with it, with, 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 with their, 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 their research. Next, you know, have one standing, standing in a creek yelling at them. Yeah, and this is a paradigm shift that every witness yeah. has. You know, regardless of your status or your education, you're now confronted with something you've never seen before. We 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 all end up on the same level. Yeah, absolutely on the same level. You realise that you're not alone on this planet. There's something else um, walking this earth with you. And the other thing that also happens is for some people, the uh, AYR. Um, witness uh becomes a place where they can just um uh you know divulge what they've seen and that's it they have their their sighting yeah. and they don't want anything else to, yeah to do and it. and this is where sarah is really important yeah uh sarah has that cathartic energy about her sarah um, Bignall. she's uh she's a very very special but we're, we're very privileged to have sarah uh, now, hey Sarah. Hi Sarah. Yeah, she's watching right now. Hi Sarah. I'm your favorite. No, he's, no, you're not. Put the wine down, <laughs> Sarah. Put the wine down. We we all know it's me. So, <laughs> so you know, Sarah's Sarah's a you know, we're, she's, Sarah's an absolute godsend, and um, she'll be the first to tell you. Uh, she, she um she has this 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 manner with the witnesses that just breaks down walls, and she she can extract. The most amazing information because she takes her time and she's methodical and she gets right into the story she's invested in the story basically uh, she's living this living the experience as they're telling the story which is so important for an interviewer that's the way a, a, an interviewer should conduct themselves you put yourself in the scene that way you can drag out all the information yeah i think sarah does a, a really fantastic job and i actually had the opportunity to sit down with her earlier this week and i actually got to ask her some questions about what her involvement with uh, AYR is and and you know how it's actually uh changing i guess her her view of the world because you are dealing with something that is you know technically not supposed to exist so we're i think we've reached about the halfway mark of tonight's show so um i'm going to play this interview with sarah and uh that will give us a chance to freshen up and we'll come back after that Sarah, it's unfortunate that you couldn't make the trip up, but I have snuck away and uh, we're having a little one-on-one -on -one while the guys are getting refreshed. So I, I do have a couple of questions for you because the, the guys, they're here, they're having a great time. And unfortunately, I don't get the, the opportunity to ask you the questions that I get to ask them. But I want to know, what's it like doing the, the AYR reports and the and the interviews that you do because this is something that really only a handful of people have had the the I guess the luxury of doing so what's it like doing these AYR interviews it's such a privilege for a start that's the first thing it's such a privilege um when I first started it was also very nerve-wracking because I I was very conscious of making sure that I did a good job that I asked all the questions that you need to ask and I mean and getting my audio levels right is really was really hard at the beginning too um it's 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 a it's a there's a methodology that I follow so I let the, the witness I kind of have a little chat to start with and make them feel comfortable and um and then I ask them to go through the whole story in as much detail as they can remember from start to finish 
uh, and I won't interrupt. And I even tell them that I won't do the normal uh uh-huh, mm-hmm noises that people generally make in conversation that don't sound great uh, when you're recording something and they don't sound great in an interview. So I warn them that don't don't wait for me to go mm-hmm because <laughs> I'm I am listening, but I won't interrupt until until we get to the end. I'm much better at that now. I used to be really bad at it, and and Dean would get curse me because I I um I just kept um. I just kept uh, umming and ahhing and uh-huh <laughs> throughout the whole the whole thing. Um, so it's really quite special and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to, to listen to people's stories. I get to hear things that nobody else gets to hear or very few people, and you know this because you do the same thing. We get to hear stories that very few people get to hear and we, we're, we're that go-to person and that person who's contacting us is actually entrusting us with this not only their story their confidentiality and their their privacy at in some circumstances um but also uh it's really important for me to make that that process uh as comfortable and easy as possible and that that person walks away feeling better after talking to me and after sharing that and getting it off their chest uh, and knowing that they're not alone because there's lots of other people who've who've experienced what they have. So for now, I just love it. It's so much fun. I'm, I'm excited every time I've got an interview to do. Um, I make sure, you know, there's all the equipment checking and sound checking, and I always do a, 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 a practice check with um, the, my latest one is uh, Telstra <laughs> because nobody picks up the phone ever. So um, I always do a phone call check before I call that person. Uh, I don't know if you do. Do you do the same thing? Uh, yeah, there's there's quite a process because, you know, people, the, the, the reality is some people just get cold feet at the last minute and it's, uh, it's, it's not a good situation for anyone because then, you know, you don't want yet that guest or that potential guest to feel pressured like they need to come on and, you know, share these stories because, you know, these things, they are so, so mystical, so wonderful and, and so personal and, and unique that, you know, you truly are the most special person in the world at that moment while this person is unleashing what has happened to them. Especially if you're a man uh, and a guy, if you're an older man and you're not used to sharing feelings or or letting people know that you actually were terrified, um, it, it can be quite quite difficult. And if people have, I find if people have heard my voice before on other um, audio reports, they're, they're sometimes a little bit nervous as well. I, I get the, oh, it's really weird talking to you and hearing your voice. Um, so the first part of that 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 call is is reassuring them that everything's they're safe, everything's uh, they can trust me and they, they can trust the process and that I'm I'm listening with a hundred percent attention. Yeah, and I think that's fantastic. I think you do an incredible job with. Every interview that you do, not let let alone just the stuff you do for AYR, but also the stuff that you do for Yowie Central, which I think is an amazing okay. podcast. And you always keep me on my toe. So it's <laughs> watch your back, dude. Yeah, I know. For you. I have to watch out for you. You're you're, you're catching me, and I'm worried. <laughs> <laughs> As if. <laughs> so As if. has has your perception of the of the bush, and I guess of the Yowie change since doing AYR interviews? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm certainly more conscious of of when I'm out in the bush. I'm conscious of my surroundings way more than I, than, than I ever was. Uh, I'm never. I'm not usually frightened. Um, I've got three dogs, and I'm pre- I'm pretty sure that if there's something lurking in the bushes out there, that my dogs will let me know beforehand. Um, but I I'm I'm very conscious of smells and sounds and I, I check behind trees I'm always looking at the outlines of trees to make sure there's not one peeking out behind a tree um so yeah definitely it impacts I I do a lot of bushwalking by myself but I don't go too far from home and I always take the dogs with me I'd never go out by myself ever um no way and I would never go out camping by myself anymore um no, that's too scary. That's too scary. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you at all. Some of these stories, you know, they are they're terrifying. And the the way that these people just tell what happened to them in just such a matter of fact way is 
I think it makes those stories so much scarier. And it's not a, I think this happened. It's, no, this this is what happened. This definitely happened to me in this way. I'm retelling it to the my absolute truth of how I, I recollect what was going on. How do you find the reactions from these these witnesses, you know, like how do how do they react to to what's just happened to them? I find sometimes. Well, it depends on if it's an older if it's the, if it happened twenty thirty years ago, which is often the case. People report things many years after they've happened. It's just been simmering away, sitting there inside, and they haven't really had a chance to talk to many people about it. So I find. Uh, people are maybe a little bit more matter of fact or it sounds a little bit more matter of fact when it's an older account, when it's a newer one or something happened very recently, you can really hear it in people's voices. But even so, I mean, I'm saying that, but even so, you talk to someone who, who had an experience 30 years ago, they might say it in a matter of fact way, but they're totally genuine. Like you can, you can hear it. You can hear the residual fear in their voice, definitely. Um, well, Sarah, it's it's so great. It's unfortunate that you couldn't make the trip up here because I tell you what, we would have had the party of our lifetime with the whole oh my God. crew here. <laughs> It'd be mayhem. <laughs> Pandemonium. <laughs> Absolutely. But before I let you go, Sarah, I have to you have to tell the people where can people find you? Okay, so you can find me at you can find Yowie Central at uh Yowie Central at gmail.com if you want to send me an email and I've got a um you can find the podcast on Spotify Apple podcast Google podcast Amazon Stitcher Podbean all of, all of those all the major platforms uh, and you can find me uh you can find Australian Yowie Research Witness Audio Reports on our website and our AYR website or our YouTube channel Okay, we are back for part two, and uh, we all checked our phones, and <laughs> Sarah came on and said, uh, we can't hear anything. So uh, there seems to be a little bit of a, a tech issue. It was going too smoothly for my liking. So It's the government. It is. It's all about the audio, some of it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll have to MacGyver a little bit of the no, audio. We're just going to start the show again, if no worries. <laughs> so, guys. Welcome to the uh, the live stream today. I'm joined by. No, we are. Um, wait wait <laughs> so yeah, look, we'll three run, hour special. We'll, <laughs> it might go for a three hour special. It is going for a three hour special. Maybe we might have to do an it hour. It is going uh, for a, a sealed hour section. Do something behind the scenes. No commitment. <laughs> I don't know. Dean's got a good voice. He could sing like Seal. I, I don't mind that. Yeah, I don't mind either. But um, what we'll do is uh, for any future, uh, I guess, audio that comes from the uh, the screen, we'll, we'll MacGyver something. So, um, but the show will go on. So um, where are we at here? Well, we just heard from Sarah, and isn't she wonderful? Uh, I love such, her. Such a, She's an amazing such a, person. a lovely, lovely person. We're very, as, as I keep saying, uh, we're very fortunate to have her on board. Um, okay, so I think we're going to lead on to the footage the footage that we, we've taken uh there's a backstory to the footage how we got there and that story is just as interesting or nearly as interesting as the footage itself but just the, the way that we found our ourselves on the top of this mountain in that location 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, the footage that Dean is referring to is obviously the flow footage that they captured last year. Um, in my opinion, it is up there. There's there's kind of three pieces of evidence that I count as the holy grail of of Bigfoot evidence. One is the um, and I just watched the cringe here, the uh, Patterson Gimlin film. I love it. Uh, second is the Sierra sounds, and uh, I think this is right up there with them. Right. So. What happened was on the on the first day, we had this grand idea of getting down to this area that I particularly wanted to go for the last 20 odd years. And I'd always felt that this is where they're coming from, particularly during droughts. Uh, we'd have a, a high range of activity on this particular mountain on the top of Springbrook. And when we did the topos and we looked at all the maps, uh, it's quite obvious where they're coming from. So we needed to get down there. And it wasn't until recently that, the ranges that opened up certain tracks allowed us to get down to a certain extent. Then the rest we had to go through virgin bush, uh, you know, rainforest, etc., and areas that uh, that humans haven't basically trekked ever. So this won't take too long. This is the one of the first. This is the first trek, and I don't. There's no audio on that, so don't no one be concerned. Um, this is that's Tony Cooper and. Obviously, Gary there. And Gary? That was uh, finding a succession of five, I think it was 17-inch footprints, foot impressions. Uh, that was a snake that didn't like the look of Dean, understandable. Well, they were everywhere. And this is the sort of thing that we had to uh, na navigate. And back onto snakes, I mean, Gary basically jumped over a, a rock and landed uh, in the middle of the figure eight. Now, see this that the stick there, and the, this one right in the background there. Now, there's no trees around that dam for those to fall from, so you can take that one out of the equation. This is SOS one. We're in big trouble here now. SOS that there, that there's a raft and it sunk, uh, so that one didn't uh, work out too well. Uh, we had no, this is SOS two. Um, <laughs> we <laughs> and uh, we, we, we we're in big trouble. I mean, basically, yeah. the emergency services were going to come and look for us. Now, this is Gary. Gary had a grand idea. Gary was going to save us, and both myself and Tony just As like, usual. scoffed, scoffed As at usual. him. Yeah, yeah, okay, Gary. So we've gone a separate <laughs> way to Gary. And then, lo and behold, before we knew it, here's Gary coming around the horn with SOS three. <laughs> now, strangely enough, SOS three saved us, as Gary normally does. Uh, Gary comes to the rescue quite often on expeditions and, yeah, here he comes. He saved the day. So we get all of our equipment, all of our gear back onto uh, – back onto. let me just go back to a, a, a still here um, – onto this particular raft that Gary had, um, had made and we had something in the vicinity of two kilometres to paddle all the way back to safety and just just right on dusk before the helicopters were kind of going to come and look for us. Yeah, that was a uh, that was an exciting day. Uh, that that included even finding a location that looked like a, a casual day bed for something, uh, symbols, structures, this kind of thing, this particular area. And again, keep in mind you. This, this area is not somewhere where people go to. Like you would have to trek through some severe thick bush to get to this particular area. Uh, but we were just that depleted and that over it. We just wanted to get out. So, okay, structure, yeah, cool. X, yeah, whatever. Let's keep going. And again, yeah, we, we, we the, the three of us uh, jumped into the water. And as many people may remember, this is where I lost my wedding ring. Sorry, wife. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, and yeah, almost almost two kilometer paddle. I'd, I'd run there. out of water. Uh, I was cramping up. Uh, I was in bad shape. And even while swimming that two kilometers, I was cramping up. My legs were cramping up, and I was almost sinking. Uh, so that was a that was a really bad day. So as a result of that, we've gone. Okay, we're never going to do that again. Let's find another way in. So late at night, we thought we'd have come up with another great idea and we would kayak in and buck was there on this occasion and so off we set just before well just before dusk um and uh we'd go in through this way and again we've got tony with buck there on the shore and, and gary oh, this is where those bones that you found from the previous expedition were. that's the one that, that that big log was almost like a dinner table 
with that uh, that that carcass laid on top of that Some log. type of bird that had its flesh sucked off. So we we got right to the end here, and this is where this is the destination that we'd aimed for. This is where we wanted to go, and we had the thermal sketch. Now <laughs> look at this. Now out of the, out, out of the corner of our eyes. We see something like we see a silhouette. I'm going, what the heck is that up the tree? And it's pointing to the local Starbucks. No, it's not. <laughs> a Pizza Hut. And and we couldn't make it out. So Tony lit it up. And you know, here is this strange anomaly. That's Tony there Stump lighting it up. And it, it just looked like a ninja sitting in a tree, doesn't it? And that's the that's the type of stuff that I think would fool a lot of regular campers. That's why you need to calm down for three seconds. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Take a breather and then so, Somebody pointed out, yeah. and we've all looked and gone, holy, what the yeah, heck? Yeah, I, mean, I remember that. Like, at, at first, we all looked up and gone, oh, up there, quick, look. And then we, again, we took our three seconds, composed ourselves, went, oh, no, stump squatch. Even in that picture, even all lit up, it still looks – yeah. Very compelling. Yeah. Doesn't it? I mean, it's, it's got all the attributes yeah. of a human. I will tell you the funny thing is where that is pointing to, that's where we noted eye shine, green yeah. eye shine at about eight, yeah. nine foot. Wow. So yeah. Is is that a sign? We, 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 had, <laughs> we, 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 we had movement there, but we'll get onto that in a sec. But so anyway, we'd set up a, a camp, uh, a rough camp. Now, we had to be out of there at, at – I think we sort of left about four o'clock in the morning, something like that. And so we had something to eat and we went for a trek along this area uh, that, I mean, humans just don't go here. Uh, you're not allowed on there anyway. So Tony and, and Buck and Gary, they're all down towards this area here. And lo and behold, they started to find all these footprints. Yeah. So we've uh, come across three to four footprints. Uh, Buck and Tony, so where, where, that, where that torch is being shone there, that's exactly where the eye shine was. So green eye shine at roughly seven and a half to eight and a half foot tall. Uh, Buck and Tony ventured in there. They actually found a pathway through the reeds where something had pushed through the reeds up there and was basically standing on a, on, on a plateau observing us. Probably, and then when, yeah, when yeah. myself and Dean come up on their position, uh, yeah, we, we, we found some foot impressions. And not only that, but Tony and Buck, again, as they do, as Buck does, uh, here's something moving off through the bush. Yeah, there was some uh, a really interesting action going on. Um, probably what uh, intrigued whatever was looking at us was us seeing the stump squatch up in the tree, shining a light at it. There's a fire going, so now there's unusual activity where no human goes. So we're in their turf. Tony sees some eye shine. We cross this uh, little uh, inlet. And we go through this very, very tall, claustrophobic stand of grass, and there's a massive, um, uh, a massive hole in the lantana that uh, something's pushed through, and we hear something uh, moving, walking uh, up around us. We can't see it. We haven't uh, got the uh, thermal with us by then. I think we only had one, and it was still with Dean, and you were using it. Think back by the fire, and then we called you over. That's when you found this great footprint, and uh, we and were. This taxed. is an area where you will not find humans, and there were so yeah. many different types of footprints there, all different sizes, ranges, sizes, uh, and snakes. Obviously, snakes, snakes, snakes everywhere. Snakes. <laughs> not, not, not to mention the uh, the original footprints we found when we arrived in the kayaks. And you weren't aware that I had no shoes on. And I was stomping through the mud. Oh, yeah. Just doing what I do. And Dean, I, I hear from behind me, uh, Dean get all excited and call out to Buck and call out to Tony. Come here, quick, 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 check it out. We found some footprints. Look at them. This is a succession of like oh, 12. Oh, come on, Gary. I wasn't that excited. He was. He was. He was. <laughs> you he know, was. He that, was. That, 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 the story. that actually leads me to a question because – you know, you go to, to all these areas that are, are very secluded and to to find footprints, like that's just so out of the normal. And, yeah. you know, for humans to, to be walking through the bush barefoot is Nobody it's a super can rare get thing. There. It and is there was yes. kilometres away from from anywhere. Uh, and yeah, Not to mention the hard totally slog to get there in the yeah. first place. It's, it it, it's just, there's no snakes. footpath. 
There's no footpath, so you can't casually walk barefoot. You you are pushing you cannot, through dense. You can't get down get there, there from the other from the other side. You just can't. I mean, we tried. We got in a lot of trouble, and you know, we were like seconds from being airlifted out. Mm. No. Yeah, we sent a drone Until I came along. that area. Until Gary said the day. <laughs> really, really unfriendly. This drone just went over. When I looked at what uh, we had to get through, uh, I just realised that no one's walking down there except us idiots, you know, and uh, we're wearing shoes. We, we often question our sanity on these expeditions. It's all fun and games when we begin, but on the way out, it's like, I need a vacation. <laughs> yeah, I could imagine you're halfway through it and you're just like, why? Why are we here? That was that was the last one with with uh, myself, Dean, and Shannon. It, it was it was it was beautiful. There's there some beautiful pictures taken. We had a nice swim. Uh, we got down to that creek, and there was what do you call the 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 the, the fish spa where the fish take his um, follicles off. We got into this creek, and the fish started. I'm not even joking. That, it happened. It's beautiful. And then we had to get out. <laughs> I'm glad you treated that <laughs> fungus Gary, problem. Gary saved my my backside that day he really did um I, I think i'd still be down there if it wasn't for gary again again gary saves the day i thought about leaving him there but i can't do that. so okay at, at the end of the trip the kayaking trip we've made our way back up to the road back where we've got the vehicles and we're loading the van with the kayaks and all the equipment and uh, this is roughly about three four o'clock in the morning i don't know I was, I'm, I'm thinking about four thirty. Roughly about four thirty, apparently. And I went up there and I said, "Dean, I just heard something move up there." And then you went up, took your kayak up there. So they're, they're still behind. I've gone back up to the kayak, and just above me is this bipedal creature, and it starts growling. Now, this growl was guttural, and the way I read it was it was annoyed. It was that annoyed sort of growl. It wasn't aggressive. But it was annoyed that we were there, and we've made a lot of noise as we were dragging those kayaks up. Well, I mean, we we just been paddling for hours, and then to drag kayaks up, we, we we're exhausted, absolutely exhausted, yeah, we're depleted. So that set up the precedent for the next step towards the footage. And I'll <laughs> <laughs> this is funny. So <laughs> we met down the bottom here, and we are we. Okay, a couple of hero shots. I'm sorry about that. I love this boy band. <laughs> <laughs> All the great tracks. Um, <laughs> Boys to Men was inspired by. And us. now I'm pointing up here, basically where. Oh, okay, well that was a bit quick, wasn't it? That's basically yeah. where where it was all happening. So we're all setting up for the night, and Gary's got the thermal, uh, one of the new thermals there. And well, well, j just before that, that's where you you and I decided to uh, trek up Hamstring Hill, which is what we call Hamstring Hill. And, um, yeah, so basically, Dean, I thought, we'll, we'll, we'll just go up this ridge line, have a bit of a look around. And as it does, we go, what's that up there? Let's have a look up there. What's that up there? And we're finding impressions. We're, again, we're finding foot impressions of different sizes. So, we, oh, we'll go. And next thing you know, we're like one and a half kilometres along this ridge with no water. Uh, maybe we should turn back. And um, on the way back down to the cars, we're coming down. So, again, this is why it's called Hampshire Hill. Hang on. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to that. It's funny. You tell it then. <laughs> Let's finish this story. Fine. Okay, kids, Whatever. come on. Play nice. This is what I've got to deal with. <laughs> right. So anyway, <laughs> back to the story. Uh, so so Gary, Gary's gone to the to, to this top and he's he's filmed what's coming down the hill and uh, on, on the thermal and he is telling the story. That was the action I was doing. Um, did you did you hear any bipedal movement? No, I think this is just a, a continual crunching, pushing through the bush coming down. And it was Quite slow as well. Yeah, slow. Something that went in. I've heard since you come up. Okay, so what I am explaining there, if you couldn't quite catch that one there. So myself and Jacob were up there beside the road. And we had Dean um, as, as another team a bit, bit lower down the hill there. So basically what happened was it sounded like a bulldozer coming through the bush. I pull the camera up, the thermal camera that we use now, and this massive heat signature starts pushing down through the bush. Again, it just sounded like a bulldozer crashing through the bush. 
and then it splits into two different heat signatures. Uh, the distance where we're talking roughly about 80 to 100 metres away. So, again, this is our first time uh, using this camera in this situation. And I then watched as one of these beings was like, I'm assuming, ripping bulbs out of the ground on, on, the, on the side of the mountain, uh, ripping bulbs out, throwing them, throwing them behind, moving around trees. Uh, as you saw, saw there, there, there was one heat signature looked like it was holding a tree, that one there, uh, holding a tree and looking around to the right-hand side. And that, that deeper heat, that brighter heat signature you can see there, which we'd assume would be the shoulder. Uh, so coming down the mountain on all fours possibly, uh, which would be why those shoulders would be a lot more, uh, sh sh showing a lot more heat. Uh, this this instance lasted for about 14, 15 minutes uh, of watching these two beings move around, do their thing on the side of the hill. I honestly don't even think they knew that myself and Jacob were standing there. And the only reason that this scenario ended was because a car drove up. So we we, we, we are on a public road, uh, on one side of the public road. I was filming to the opposite side of the public road. And the only reason that this situation ended was when the car came up. Of course, they, they, they come up, see us, see two of us standing there on the side of the road at 1.30 in the morning with a camera facing up into the hill. And they slowed right down. They yelled out, there's Yowies up there, boys. <laughs> and, yeah. Of course, uh, which lays, lays credence to uh, what we were filming. And I think that alerted these two beings uh, to our presence. And this then this then leads on to what Buck will tell you later on, is that when these beings want to be heard, they'll be heard. When they don't, they will not be heard. So when they left, when they, when they arrived, they arrived like two bulldozers through the bush. When they left, absolutely nothing. No noise as they entered, no noise as they left. Other way around. Lots of noise when they entered. Kind of like um, Buck, really, at uh, public toilets in a park. <laughs> <laughs> uh, boy's got to earn a living. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was that. I mean, but we're starting to run out of time here. We had a lot more to show. Um, We've got plenty of time. No. Just run we, it. Well, we only have half an hour. No, so. we don't. We've got lots of time. <sighs> We got we got some audio here of, uh, of uh, back back at uh, AYR HQ. This is this, this, this is this this is where we're analysing the footage of the night before. That's uh, oh, Dean's beautiful so wife, Lisa. <laughs> Just one private centre for. Have you seen his body naked? Yes. <laughs> yes, you have. <laughs> when he was showing me his bruises, and then my wife was very suspicious. She said, "What is this on your phone?" Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what is this on your phone? I said, that's Dean. That's Dean? <laughs> Dean's got bruises. What did you do? Not me. <laughs> so, all right, we'll get out of that. But I just thought that was funny. Now, we went, we actually went back to um, to this location, myself and Gary, to have a, a, a quick look around. And um, on my way back down, I mean, I was fit as a fiddle on the way up. And on our way down, I had a little accident, and um, <laughs> it was hilarious. And you know, I'd, I'd gone to go step over this uh, this this log, and there was a tree there, and I'd grappled that as I was stepping over, and that was rotted and it broke. Now one foot uh, stayed in one direction, and my body went in another. And as I'm coming down, everything's in slow motion. Three, two, one, and then snap, my hamstring went and I was in agony. And Gary was there and I thought, okay, great, Gary's there, he's going to give me a hand, uh, sympathetic, and uh, <laughs> I'm basically lying there dying. Uh, in fact, I was pretty much dead. Uh, I, I think I died. Um, 
He and cried. Left your body. <laughs> it he was, cried. If not, my soul was leaving my body. <laughs> and uh, and I thought, he, Gary, what does Gary do? What did I do? I did what any normal person would do. He I took, said, Dean, don't move. I'm coming to your rescue. As I approach Dean. Jesus. <laughs> As I approach Dean, don't move. Don't I, thought, move. I thought, oh, my God, good. He's coming. He's coming to rescue me. Yeah, I didn't. I said, don't move. I pulled my phone out. I took a photo. For Facebook. For Facebook. <laughs> he took I a laughed. photo for Facebook. Then I laughed and I helped him up. Yeah. So I, I did kind of help. Yeah. So, okay. So that was the end of that. Ooh, now I'm in trouble. Try and find that again. Um, but yeah, that, that then led us onto another expedition to actually hike up this ridge line with a, pur- with a purposeful manner. And with actual supplies, not just no water and our confidence. Uh, so myself, Dean and Jacob uh, pushed, pushed up this uh, ridge line one day. Um, as we did, we, we found footprints of multiple different sizes. We actually, or I should say Dean actually even found a knuckle impression in the dirt. And you could quite easily see it. Like I, I, um, I even uh, went up to it myself with my hand, my fist, and placed it inside this, this impression in the dirt. And it fit perfectly. It was just a lot bigger than my hand. Uh, we pushed on, and that led us onto the top of the ridge line, which is where we ended up coming across uh, the signs that we do find with the troops that do live in Springbrook, uh, the sticks in the ground, etc. Yeah. So, I mean, with experience, you you get to know what's around you, uh, and and the signs, whether they be sticking up out of the ground or against the tree or you know, on the ground themselves and making certain symbols that are all very similar to each other. Uh, so having a look at these symbols here behind me, this is what we're this is what we're looking for, and this is what we're finding. And these are all different ones from from different areas. These are what what we're calling the A's. And then, uh, and can, can I just ask? Do you think there's a reason that these look like arrows? Do you think they're pointing to something? some? Some look like arrows. Some look like triangles. Some look like houses. Well, if you see, have, you, have a look at this one here, and you can see that uh, this is broken in a one couple, stick. One stick broken in two areas to do the same symbol as a lot of the others that we find, and we'll find this a lot of times that they are broken, twisted, yeah. to, to, and put in exactly the same formation and if, if it's not one stick it'll be three sticks to to create the triangle and it, and it requires which, hands to correct, do that correct and but the, the, the thing is with, with these triangles it's not just a random triangle that, that's falling on the ground if you pay attention to these symbols each stick is under over under over under over right so there, there is a formula to correct. it then if there's so, a yeah okay then does that make you then go down the route of thinking that this may be a language yes yes i have for a little while now, I've been trying to cross-reference ancient languages, uh, ancient Sumerian, rune stones, to try and correlate and try and get close to, to what these symbols may mean. We have found some which do get close to the symbols that we do find. Uh, unfortunately, at this stage, nothing concrete, just because close. It's, it's really interesting because like, I've heard of one encounter in, in my whole in, entire life, um, and, and it's actually like a friend of, my, friend of mine, friend of yours, Craig Zammett. Who encountered? So um, Craig, hey Craig, go check out his YouTube channel. Craig, he has two of them, and they're amazing. Um, but he told me that he saw almost like scripture at one of his little bushcraft uh, like setups, as I guess is how I would call it. But like a written language, right? Well, I mean, look, Craig, Craig does go deep bush by himself, and as one man, he's nuts. He yeah, him, one man. And again, being one man, uh, it is more likely that you will have activity being one man by yourself. Yeah, or, or a missing person. <laughs> now, he's, oh, he's, that he's, missing he's, he's crazy for doing that. Now, this this next one, I mean, we've um, this is what we call a conversation. We will find across the track, right across the track, uh, all these different symbols. Um, now, they normally go, well, left to right, I guess. Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I don't have them all. I, I didn't load them all. But there's right across the tr- tracks, you'll see very similar things. You now with the X markers, etc., and just uh, an amazing ensemble of 
sticks, Gary. We found a great one the other day that I, I don't think we documented other than on video. The thing is, well, with these, these, these symbols, they're not fan typical places either. No, so you can kind of rule out uh, people uh, who probably get on the blurb and say, look, um, yeah, I do orienteering and I'll leave stick signs like this. Yeah. And we go, okay, do you do a crap on a, a rock <laughs> in the middle of the street? Because that's where we're finding them. The, the thing you know. is as well with, with the orienteering, which we have found orienteering trails, but they're always red or orange, pink uh, ribbon tied yeah. to trees, which, which is an indication of orienteering going through. Some of the some of the places we find these symbols, there is, we're 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 in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and we we find these symbols jammed in the ground, placed in the ground. Uh, we we've even found some where it's not just three sticks to make a triangle, it's a multitude of up to fifteen to twenty sticks, and you'll have the you have the base triangle, then we'll have others two this way and two this way, but each stick is parallel to it to another one. It's not just a random falling. More place, so two sticks. No, be it's not dead. Perfectly fall. parallel this way. I'll two perfectly parallel this way, and they're on top of a triangle, and there's a rock standing in the middle of the whole thing. Like that's 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 not natural. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say that. You 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 could maybe forgive like a couple of sticks falling exactly. in a in a funny way, but when you see something that's got a pattern to it. Correct. And, and multiple and some, patterns yeah, around the same thing. You're yeah. going, all right, this isn't just. Something's Stuff breaking the all. rules of nature. But, yeah. but often too, we'll find um, sticks that aren't even from the same trees. Like, a, where did they fall from? A, there's correct. They they don't match the the, the surrounding trees. They've been brought in there. We yeah. found, um, you know, sticks with a root ball lent against another tree, but the root ball is facing up in the ground. So it's it can't. They can't uproot themselves, or they can't. Yeah, they can't drag themselves either. We no. found that too, where trees, uh, sticks, and trees, or small trees, are leaning against another tree. But you, you can see the root ball at the bottom, but you can see like a, a one meter drag mark where the tree came from. When a tree falls, it doesn't drag itself across the ground. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And and one thing that I, I really find fascinating when you see these types of pieces of evidence is trees that have been snapped but twisted. Yes, I, I could I again. Could, that that requires hands exactly, and I could I could fall into the nature of yeah, you know, strong wind, cool, but a, a strong wind to break and twist a tree is that's not, a little bit not too to mention far-fetched. the strength. Yeah, it, but also it, yeah, too, if the tree separated. So if the wind would do it, it wouldn't go. I'm getting rid of the leaves. I'm getting rid of the stump, and then taking this and putting it over there. The, you know, these are the questions that we ask ourselves because we want to be sure that what we're putting up there is um, going to pass some type of pub test. I mean, well, not it, not 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 just boy who cried wolf and just put it up there for the hell of it. Yeah, absolutely. Trying try, trying try, you know, good good quality substance. Yeah, good quality yeah. substance. And look, uh, in the last uh, big storm that we had. Uh, I saw some fantastic uh, stick and log sculptures. They were amazing, but they were down by burly heads and they were put there by humans and they were very curated, incredibly curated. So I know that people have done those. When I go into bush and I see something that is similar, it's not like that. It's a bit rough and ready. It's like... Um, it's not I don't so have refined. paper on me, but this is uh, this is my stationery, a stick. Yeah, I've done this. It needs food, shelter, stay away from there, whatever it is. So they're grabbing it, they're using it to communicate. We just don't know what it is. Well, that, that basically comes back to your tree breaks. So when, when, you, when you find these tree breaks that are like six to seven foot up, a lot of times if you, if you follow the tree breaks, say, say for example, if, if the tree break is pointing southeast, a lot of the time if you follow that tree break, you'll find another one. And then you you'll find another you'll find another tree back and another tree back. You keep following them. They'll generally go to it to a food source or a water source or shelter. Uh, basically, street signs for like, like like we have on on our roads, and that, they'll do a very similar thing. Okay, so we'll get back to the, uh, the the signs a little bit later because there's so much to go through, and there's a lot we want to tell people about and and show people about what what to look for, like some information. So because we're running out of time. We'll no, just get straight on to the footage. Now, this is Buck just before he left camp that night. 
Now, it was about 11 o'clock at night and Gary had um, given Buck's instructions because it was, the thermal cameras were all quite new at that stage. So given, give, you'd given uh, uh, Buck some, some yeah, information. Basically just gave, gave Buck a quick rundown on the, the basic operation that he can use the camera, uh, record, zoom, uh, take a photo, focus. So he, he had enough knowledge of this camera that he could use the camera not just go out there blindly, just press some random buttons. Mm. Um, so basically the, the the basic operations without getting too technical. Yeah. Okay, so so Bucks wandered away from camp and he had uh, radioed to us probably about 20 minutes afterwards and said that he had something, something looking at him from behind a log, was it? Well, I felt it was the, the first site, the first heat signature I got was by the big, big log um, where I used as a uh, as a reference for the night, and I thought I saw what looked like a face. Is this the is this the one now or the, no, the other this one? Is a, this is a much earlier one. This we I don't know if, if you. Yeah, I've got it here. Anyway, um, it felt like um, I had this uh, face that was. Uh, behind a tree peeking out and two heat sources that looked like hands. And so I was going, what is that? That is uh, something. And then it just backed away and disappeared. And that's the only time I thought I heard a sound like a settling where it went back behind a, a tree. And then further on, this is where I got to, where um, I said, hey, I've got something. I'm going to bring it back for you guys to review. And, again, I didn't say Yowie, because I didn't know. And I went, oh, I'll just keep working, keep working. So 20 minutes later, I hit upon this stump, which has this huge, uh, really human-shaped activity going on it, in it, around it. And I tell them that I'm videoing something and I'm trying to uh, zoom in closer. And Gary had given me um, a rundown. But... In the in the heat of the moment, uh, I'd forgotten a bit of the detail with this unit because it was more complicated than the FLIR in terms of its buttons that were assigned. They have some different functions. So you have to stop filming, zoom in, and uh, then press record again. So this is uh, after this log action here where I've got something that warrants me getting in closer, but there are big trees in the way. There's uh, all sorts of... Uh, brush I'm moving left and right and then I uh, start looking around for it and I've lost it I think I've blown it I, I can't find it and uh, the next clip goes for a minute 19 which is me making everyone dizzy trying to find this heat source again because your field of view has narrowed now and um, so I've lost that and I'm looking for it again and it's it's creepy as and um i realize at this point this is how people get eaten by lions because you're just looking through that viewfinder and go wow that is so amazing so i was trying to zoom in on that and when i did i lost that uh heat signature again and i think this is um coming up to uh the next clip that dean will play and I don't know what you guys are thinking back then, like when we, I was... We were basically just listening intently. Uh, you were coming out of the radio, giving us updates on your position, what you were watching. Uh, so basically, yeah, we, we just sat there and waited and listened. I mean, there, there, there was a time where I went halfway between camp and yourself. Yeah. Uh, basically to, to have your back, because when, when, when you are that distance away from camp, and you are by yourself in yeah. the pitch black, again, like we don't use torches, like we, we used headlamps. Uh, white light so general torch light we only use around camp uh once we leave camp it's a strict rule of red light only so we all have headlamps that uh that have a red red uh, led to them um so again bucks up there by himself in the darkness so uh, pretty much listing the buck and basically having bucks back yeah. while he uh went on to capture his his amazing so then thermals. then buck gets on the on the uh radio again and he said hey i've got two now i've got two and this is the footage just rolling now and this is as these two come through the bush and buck take it from here okay yes yeah. so it uh suddenly two creatures stepped out from behind the bush 
And I said, they're here. Uh, it's human shaped. And now you can see this filter that I'm going through because I've forgotten that I need to um, stop filming in order to zoom out because in the frame, I think I'm losing the picture because I'm looking through a tiny viewfinder. So I start to, I'm pressing all these buttons and I cascade through these um, uh, filters, uh, which in itself gives some really interesting detail. Um, and uh, while I was watching this live on a tiny, tiny screen with my eye pressed to it, I it wasn't like what the experience was when we brought it back. Like this is what I was seeing. And it's looped here for your benefit so you can see this massive frame. That is not a kangaroo. That is not Dean. That is not Gary because we – the first thing I did when I came back and I was showing them, I said, I want your heat signatures. I want all your heat signatures. He demanded. I demanded, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I also um, had asked Gary, could you have my back? Could you come up and also try and get another angle? on what I'm looking at so that we can compare. And the bush was too dense, but he did get a really good shot of me um, needing to lose some weight. <laughs> in I, yeah, I, I'd probably call it me capturing you while you captured them. Which would be watching you exactly? Which, which that, that in itself, rules yeah, we, it I, I, I do have all that, so we'll, we'll, we'll get yeah. to that. And um, uh, this is. Now, I'll have to stop here and hand over to Dean because when I arrived, it was pitch black. And when I left in the morning, there was another big bit of excitement. But uh, it took several goes uh, for them to come back and actually find where the location was because I had no uh, concept of where I was uh, yeah, at night time. It took a, an effort on Dean and Gary's part to find that uh, stand. Now, we're looking here at... The heat signatures that I demanded, that's Gary, big man Gary, and then you've got Shannon, uh, young Dean, and me going, <laughs> what am I looking at? And I've put a line across at roughly a six-foot mark, and then I've blown Gary up to uh, their size so you can see that is not Gary. No comparison at all. No need to lose some weight. And um, for people who say that's Gary, well, did he shave his beard off and then <laughs> grow one again? I ask you, there's no comparison. That is heft. I also had no idea what size it was because I didn't have any range in the dark. I'm just looking at this big solid heat mass. I've been trying to recreate, you know, experience I had when I was 15. And here it is. It's happening. And this is all due to the, you know, the mighty efforts that the team has put together to get this moment. All of us are going out there on our own time and our own dime. And when you have the camera, this is what you want to get. This is what we're out there to do. So Right. So I, I have to ask, when you capture footage of this calibre, there's obviously going to be doubters and haters and people who are jealous. It's just the way the world is when it comes to these types of topics um, because it's easier to hate than celebrate. So... Have you received any backlash about this footage? Well, we, we seem to have this this one individual that uh, he's notorious. Uh, he's a, He's been a troublemaker for uh, a decade, basically. He's been kicked off most of the Australian forums. So he goes over to America and uh, where they don't know him and he'll pretend that he is a, he's a believer. And so he goes on their forums and their message boards, et cetera, et cetera, chats and Facebooks, and he sidles up beside people and he pretends he's, he's um, you know, a believer, as I said, and then he'll start to gaslight them and turn everybody against everything. So basically, I mean, he's done all these lies for about me for, for years and years. Now, when I got hit, oh, no, it was all a hoax. And, oh, you know, he's been caught out doing uh, fake footprints and 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 this and that and they're all just just plucked out of the sky so when he went and criticized this i mean yeah of course why not uh, so basically what he's saying is that this is gary 
and myself and uh, Gary conspired against Buck because Buck's not too bright, apparently. Yeah. And um, I need a chaperone. Yeah. So oh, this, is, this is Gary. I can point to Gary. Gary's right here. So this is Dean. So if we can just bring the screen up, uh, this here, this image here, this is Buck watching the creatures uh, at real time. And then uh, you've got, uh, you got Buck turning around and filming Gary filming him. And then here is when Buck's asked for, you know, uh, Gary to come. Here is Gary. This is Gary walking up the track. Look at that difference. But, but this is Gary. I mean, basically, what? Buck has swung the camera around from filming that those two swung the camera around down the track, and here is Gary coming up the track. So how could it be in two places at once? Headlamp, beard, T-shirt, pants, not a beer in my hand. You know yeah. what I want to find really interesting about this is the fact that, you know, you've got a beard, and that's visible in this. Correct. Correct. The, the heat that these creatures must be putting out, because if we are to believe that they are covered in hair, I would assume yeah. it would be much more than what your beard is. The heat that is coming out of these creatures must be so immense. Because look at you here. Look at you here. This is – your body heat is affected by a very, very thin T-shirt. Yeah, look, it, it – Two different directions. Yeah, it baffled me. Like um, I wondered if their mass is so big that, um, uh, the you know, it just shone through. And also, too, we get reports of – uh, some creatures with short hair, they're not. Uh, and some creatures with long hair. So I don't know. Is this the short hair variety? I didn't get a chance to ask them. And and on and on, on top of that as well, if, if they came up from down below from Scat Creek, yeah, that's a lot of energy put in and expended to climb up that ridge line, which is then going to heat the body up to to quite a temperature, uh, yeah. which could also figure out that, that you know it's just pure heat punching through. Okay, so what he, what we have here on the screen is a typical witness sketch. This one's from Mount George, and uh, I've got quite a few very similar to this. Now, it shows the head sitting directly on the shoulders, very similar to our specimen there. Now, what I'll do is just bring up uh, the witness sketch, well, typical witness sketch. Now, you can see here uh, the head is very, very thick, like a gorilla around the base and it just sits on the traps. Now, you have a look at Gary blown up to the same height uh, to that eight, nine foot mark. I mean, Gary's a broad guy. I mean, he's a man bull, basically, he's an ox. Mm. And see the, the difference in the shape of the shoulders and the fact that Gary does have a neck and uh, looks nothing like this. So how this individual could possibly say, oh, you know, with authority he's saying, this is Gary, this is Gary fooling Buck. But look at this thing. Look at this thing. It looks like it is almost pure energy. Correct. There is a, um, a phasing in there. Like you can see, um, it's so hard to see, but there is a, a darker yellow and a lighter yellow. And that is, I guess, due to some type of... Um, uh, heat dissipation or maybe fur, but um, where whenever Gary has something on, uh, you can see there's his arms, there's his head, um, and blowing him up to that size. You you, can there's see, no comparison. No, there's no comparison. I mean, you'd have to be a very foolish uh, individual to suggest that that is Gary. Now, also, let's do another comparison, shall we? Let's do like a, a – a side comparison. Now, this is uh, this is it before it's leaning forward here. Now it's got the Homer Simpson sort of um, snout going on. The surgical crest, the deep set eyes going in there. I mean, Gary does. Gary's a bit Neanderthal, but he, he's not that Neanderthal. Yeah. Cheese, mate. Uh, and this is just it cleaned up a little bit. So basically that's what it looks like, and that is Gary. So, I mean, that is not a human, is it? Look well, at the it, surgical crest. It has a very silverback gorilla type profile. Absolutely. Uh, you, you show that to anyone, they, they could think that's a, the silhouette of a gorilla. Correct. Every day yeah. of the week. Correct. How someone could possibly suggest that that is human, I have no idea. 
other, other than just you know plucking it out of the sky for his own agenda. Well, we we naturally are going to get people if you show them this heat signature. That if you show it to the man down the pub, they might need some more um, proof. Like I've got uh, loved ones in my family who are very happy for me to uh, go on these adventures and uh, they're always asking what I've got. And I might get excited about this thermal image, but it won't really do much for them because it's out of context. They don't understand where I am. They don't understand uh, the effort that's gone to get in there and a natural conclusion for people might be, oh, that's just someone in a suit. No, that's not someone in a suit. That's not one of us. It's not a kangaroo. It's definitely not an elephant. It's not a bear. It's not a koala bear. It's not a possum. Well, I, I think at the end of the day, this depiction here tells the story. The side-on view tells the story. That image right there, that is something of a hominid, not a hominin. Uh, there is a difference between the two. And also we've produced the fact that, you know, Buck has swung from filming them to to Gary walking up on the track from a completely different direction proves, matter of fact, no doubt, that was not Gary. Yeah, absolutely. And, guys, I want to thank you so much for coming all the way to Cairns because – we have reached the end of the uh, the scheduled show, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna put an open question out to uh, to you, lovely gentlemen. Do we go on? Yes. Should absolutely. we? Should we? Yes. Should we? Yes. Tack on another yes. hour and embrace the woo. Yes. I, I want to embrace. We the have woo. woo. I think we, we have lots of woo. Yeah. I, I we we need to we need to have another break. So what we might clearly do is we, I want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh let's do it let's let's tack on another hour let's embrace the woo uh let's get into the weird the wonderful and um if if we have the time maybe we'll take some questions from the viewers no commitment like just do it <laughs> he, act, he acts like he's on borrowed time it's his show cade the almighty bowing down <laughs> Let's have a break. Let's have a break. Okay, All right. We'll cut you a break. So what I'll do, I'm going to have to run a, another timer here for this one here, but um, ignore that. The show will be continuing after this. We'll just run a five-minute timer, and uh, we will see everyone shortly. Oh, that's a really good um, – I'm sorry, but he's going to be – Oh, that's a bit fucking blown out.
We are back and uh, this we're going into hour three. This is officially the longest live stream that has ever happened on the Believe channel. Uh, so, Booyakasha. let's do it. So, uh, guys, we are now going into the part of the show that uh, I've been waiting for. All the special bits. I'm Willis. The, the woo. So, um, the, the world of the Yowie, the Sasquatch, the Bigfoot, it's, it's weird enough as it is. But big footprints, growls, things like that, that's not the only thing that really happens when people encounter these things. Uh, look, look, look at these two lean forward now. Yeah, look, <laughs> this is the I've first time they're so engaged. <laughs> Tell us another story, Dad. So, um, uh, but the thing is, like, the, that's really only one aspect of this, of this creature. Um, one thing that I hear more often than not is the, the presence of orbs. UFOs. Balls of light, things like that. Have you ever encountered anything like this in your expeditions? Dean and I have. We had a uh, got a bit, bit, bit forgetful there. <laughs> <laughs> so, myself and Dean one night up at Springbrook uh, decided to go up there in the dark, sit there with a couple of chairs. Sort of sit back into the camera view a bit. Uh, where are we? Sorry. There we go. Uh, sit up in the dark and just talk. We, we went up there to research. We went up there to look for anything. We had no torches. I think we might have a torch to see where we were going to get to where we were. But we were probably about almost a kilometre down, down a certain trail that we, we, we do regularly visit. Basically, all we did was we, we took, the, took the chair, our chairs, sat the chairs in the middle of the track uh, and just sat there and talked for a couple of hours. Uh, I think it was till like three o'clock in the morning or something like that. And at one point, this, this, this is before uh, we acquired the new guide thermal cameras. Dean had the, the old FLIR camera with him though. And it came one point where we're talking and then Dean, every, every now and again, Dean would pick up the thermal camera and look around and just have a bit of a pan around the place. Excuse me. And, uh, at one point, Dean goes, don't move. Of course, when someone says don't move, when you're in the middle, middle of the bush, in the middle of the darkness, of course, for a split second, you freak out. So I've, I've come to attention, what, what, what? And don't move. So he's picked the, he, he's got the, the thermal camera looking over my left shoulder. And on either side of the track, uh, the bush was probably about a metre and a half away from us. What Dean was watching was a massive heat signature a heat signature that you would relate to a yaoi size heat signature. But it was, I think it was far enough away that he couldn't quite get a grasp on what it was. It is thick bush, so again, that, that that's going to cover up any defining shapes. And then after about 30 seconds or so, that heat signature disappears. There's nothing there. Seconds later, a red orb floats away through the trees. Oh, no. I got, I, I've got chills. Oh, you wait, buddy. You they wait. Are. <laughs> that would be a flashback for you. <laughs> uh, that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, but that just really opens up so many questions and, and really so many possibilities of... We, like, we, we, there's so many strange occurrences to do with Yowies. Are they connected? I can't tell you yes or no. Do we get reports, multiple reports of this two, the two instances in, in, in the same report? Yes, we do. Be it Yowie, UFO or UFO Yowie, one comes out the other, other way around. We, we had, we had a, um, an expedition one night uh, down toward this dam that we kayaked on. And it was, this night was only myself, Shannon and Dean. And Dean went up the track a little bit. Myself and Shannon stayed at camp. And not long after Dean going up there, he's coming out of the radio saying, oh, this, I've got something just down below me moving through the bush. Bipedal, heavy, snapping branches pushing through the bush. He was in that, that, that sort of position where he, he couldn't see anything, but he could easily hear it. So myself and Shannon stayed back at camp. And above us was the tree canopy, but directly above us was an opening in the tree canopy. 
So as Dean's coming out of the radio saying, I've got something very big, very bipedal, very, very big and bipedal pushing through the bush down below me. Next thing you know, if you can picture the sound of, of a stunt kite, when, when, when someone dives a stunt kite, that flutter noise. Yeah, yeah. Picture that and then cross that with a mechanical buzz. Shannon and I immediately look directly up above us. So the the sound came from above? It came from above. And this is 10 to 20 seconds after Dean goes, heavy movement, snapping branches, bipedal, it's down below me. I can hear it. It's been moving for a little while. We hear this, Shannon, Shannon and I hear this noise directly above us. We both look up at the same time. What do we see? A big black V directly really? on top of us. Not fast, but moving consistently. No lights, just a black silhouette in, in, in the opening of the trees. Big black V with that flutter, mechanical buzz kind of sound. And it just kept going. And straight after that, we're like, did you see that? Yeah. Did you, what did you see? What did you see? We both saw the same thing. What's that do to the atmosphere of that situation? Oh, we just get excited. We break out, <laughs> we, we break out the glow sticks and go clubbing. Yeah. <laughs> because those are – most people will go through their life not experiencing anything, you know, and you, you're out there for a purpose. You know, Dean is having a, a potential encounter with something bipedal, who knows what it may be, and moments later – you encounter possibly something otherworldly. And on saying that, like I, I didn't just take straight away, go, yes, it's a UFO. I researched it, I looked it up, I looked, even looked at military drones. Yes, one drone come up that was military, that was in a V shape, but was nowhere near the size of this thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to say wing to wing, uh, 15 to 20 metres across. And the, the military drone that I researched, it's about three metres across. So that's a large craft. This is a large craft. No lights, just that humming, fluttering sound. Didn't stop, it just kept going. We have many instances, many, many, even, even many, uh, many witnesses who come forward to us with very similar sightings, encounters, even other completely strange encounters. Uh, in, including shape shifting, etc. Yeah. Well, before we get onto that, because that's that's like a whole other rabbit hole that I want to go down. Is um, you're not you aren't the only person I know personally who has encountered something like that. Friend of the show and probably friend of you guys as well. Yeah, we Dan. Oh yeah. He he recently captured footage of a UFO that only showed up on Fleur while out on. I guess on a Yowie expedition himself. Yeah. That, that, was... that, that does happen like on, on, on a common basis too. I mean, like even uh, Brent Thomas from Paranormal Portal. Yeah. He captured a UFO on night vision as well. Twice. Twice. That's the luckiest so son Brent... of a bitch I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's um remarkable. Like he it was a, a I think a bit of a luckless night for them, and he noticed some bats and he wanted to get some photos of bats, if I remember correctly. And then he got this um amazing craft that's pulsating and you couldn't see it with the human eye it's only no. when you had the uh, the thermal on a, a certain setting like the, the black and white setting that it turned up okay so stories like that does that make you want to search the skies more when you're out with the equipment that you have uh i don't know i haven't got time for it gary does oh, maybe. as you know i do yeah well, but, well in my, my situation i'm normally underneath a very thick treed canopy, yeah. so I don't have much vision of the sky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could right. imagine Gary's actually out there and he would he would have like two thermals, like yeah, one Gary, looking up and one Gary looking lives and breathes it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In fact, Gary's got some really good stories. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'll, I'll if, if you want to talk woo. I'm happy to talk woo. I mean, well, it, technically it's not woo, it's real life. I mean, it's real experiences and not only by me, by my wife, by my daughter, by Shannon as well. Uh ET visits, uh, multiple times ET visits, uh, sighted twice by myself, sighted once by my wife in our house. ETs, ETs in your house? In my house. So just picture your typical four to five foot grey, yeah. as you say, uh, that. 
So the 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 first time, so you know, as you know, I've been involved in CE five for for quite a while. So that CE five, for those that don't know, is human initiated contact. Uh, Side so, note: I almost went to my first CE five event last week. I had a couple of things that came up, but it's it's on my scared. it's on my to do list. Don't be scared. <laughs> Spread the love, mate. Spread the love. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, the the the, the first time uh, that I actually did see one in the house, uh, finished watching TV and to go upstairs to go to the bed, basically had to go from the lounge room, uh, forty five degrees to the left, uh, ninety degrees right hand turn, and then a 180, 180 degree turn to go upstairs. And we have English mastiffs, so as people know, they're quite big dogs. So I'm stepping over them as they're snoring, and in the corner of the kitchen we have a really really big salt lamp. So as people know, with salt lamps, you don't turn them off. They just stay on the whole time, um, emit a glow. And as I've turned left to go upstairs, and look, the, the stairs to go up, they're, they're not solid stairs, they're individual steps. And in the reflection of the window on the back of the house, I've looked, I've seen through the gaps in the steps, uh, this silhouette outline of your typical ET. And I've poked my head around and looked, and to this day I kicked myself. I didn't say hello. How are you? I went okay, and I walked upstairs. And that was the first time. Okay, I have to ask. <laughs> right, I have to ask because, excuse my language, but I'd shit myself if I saw that. Uh, yeah, I don't. I think these. I, I tend to get like more more of a nervous excitement. Except for that time. That time I just walked upstairs. How? <laughs> I don't know. I just walked. Yeah, exactly. I just went to bed. <laughs> I just went to bed. I mean, like, I mean, there hasn't been time. You went to bed. I would have just, just no. maybe, maybe they made him go to bed. Maybe, yeah. I hey, will get to that. We'll yeah. get to that. So, <laughs> the second time, uh, which which you you do hear quite quite a fair bit, is when people suddenly wake up at like four o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. They just suddenly wake up and sit up. So I had that. It was about. I mean, it would have been about four thirty, quarter past four, four thirty. I suddenly woke up, sat up in bed like that. I look to the bedroom, the bedroom door, and if you think of the predator, when the predator goes into camo mode, in the, in the shimmer, the clear shimmer, yeah. yeah. So I don't know why I look. I woke up. I looked to the doorway. It was like I just knew to look that way, and I did so. And what I saw again was that exact that that ET being, but in that predator shimmer mode, I saw everything except the left leg. So because it was peeking around the corner. I saw the right leg. Actually, no, sorry, I, saw, I didn't see the left arm either. So I saw the right leg, the right arm, most of the body, the shoulders, the head. And regardless if it's, if it's an ET or you, if you wake up and you're standing there, it's going to give you a jump. It's just natural. I had a jump. Oh, okay. I look back, gone. And then not uh, actually probably about four months, four or five months ago, my wife had the same thing. Well, Buck just stated about going to sleep. Uh, she woke up and saw a being standing over top of me and she, she remembers like, wait, like collecting her thoughts to see, am I seeing what I'm seeing? You didn't tell me this. No, no, I haven't. I kept the special stuff for later. Did, what was the description? The same thing, the same ET being, but just this time it was just a dark, cause, cause it, it's in the bedroom. It's, it's just a dark, dark figure. Standing over top of me. Did you say how tall it was? Again, that's three to four foot in in, in that realm. And uh, yeah, she uh, wakes up. She collects her thoughts to say, yeah, well, actually wake herself up a bit. Am I saying this? And she said she sat up and she looked at it. And then next thing you know, she just went back to sleep. So it was standing on your side of the bed. Is that what you're saying? Correct. So potentially Correct. like a foot away from her. Well, we got, we got a king size bed, mate. You know, oh, we're, we're upper class. We so, get it. You're fancy. <laughs> <laughs> Three to four foot, you know. <laughs> so what, yeah. Other than standing there, what was it doing? It was uh, asking for a glass of water. I'm that, sure. Deep tissue massage. <laughs> 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 um, but no, I, I don't think she had enough time to really gather what it was doing. She just woke up, collected her thoughts. Am I seeing what I'm seeing? Saw this dark figure standing over top of me and then she just lay back there and went to sleep and she goes 
Oh, no, I just went back to sleep. I said, no, 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 you didn't go back to sleep. They put you to sleep because you weren't, you weren't meant to wake up. What what does this do to the average household? Like, oh, is, no, it, is this just something that you mate, just like it's, accept? It's, it's to the point where, like, because, of, as you know, I live in the mountains on the Gold Coast, uh, regular UFO sightings or strange lights in the sky. Even my daughter, she's four turning five. Even she has seen plenty of stuff. Uh, we we had for her third birthday, uh, cross around the park. We come back around the fire pit, and there's I think eleven people at this stage uh, witnessed a golden orb fly slowly over top of us. And I pulled out my phone. I recorded. I remember. I, my, my, one of my good mates standing there. I, I saw it. I gave him a whack. He he turned around, looked up, and by this stage, everyone's turned around looking at this at this golden orb. And I'm only, I'm only talking say. Power pole and a half high. I know it's a random thing, but people know how how high power poles are. But yeah, power pole and a half high. Golden orb. I pulled my phone out. I hit record. We followed it till it kept going, and then I went back to watch it. Didn't didn't save. Really. And Twenty minutes later, to the east, we had three light objects in the shape of a triangle come across the eastern sky. Twenty minutes after that. So again, like it happens enough up there that. My daughter, four turning five, she knows about it. Daddy, what are you doing? Are you going outside? Yeah. Are you going to talk to the star people? Yeah, yeah, baby. <laughs> wow. It's not and look, they even come back to it, like as, as we all know, kids aren't kids aren't brainwashed like we are. Yeah. They're, they're more they've open. got this unadulted mind. Correct. She's as far as I'm concerned, she's seen Yowies twice up on, on the mountain that we live on. So for example, we're walking along and because I, basically, you know, because there's bushwalks up there at the time go pick her up from daycare. And uh, we on the way home, we stop at one of the bushwalks, go for a walk, tie her out, as you know, get the kids tied, <laughs> get to bed. And uh, yeah, a couple uh, twice now, twice she's done it. So we're walking along, and as kids do, they pick up rocks and sticks and throw them and poke them and whatever. And she's a couple of meters behind me. I'm just I'm just walking slowly. She's doing her kid thing, and she goes, "Where'd he go?" I turn around. Oh. Where'd he go? I'm like, where'd who go? The monkey. Where'd he go? And she, she's looking, she's looking down, down the hill into the bush. Wow. Where did he go? The monkey. And that she, she did that twice. Yeah, I remember Gary, Gary told me this on the day. Mm. Does that make you worry? No. No, because I, I, my, my, my family's open to all this kind of thing. To, to us, it's normal life. We were ghost encounters. I've had ghost encounters. Mums are ghost encounters. It's, it's just normal thing for our family. Um, so instead of telling Willow, uh, it's, it's, it, it doesn't happen. It's not true. Just, 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 you know, just ignore just, it. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't. I say, yeah, that's fine. Or she's even like, I, I, obviously I've told the story about, about the, the ET beings in the house. There was a time where she wouldn't go into her bedroom without us. I'm like, why baby? Why? Oh, the, the, the lizard. What, what do you mean the lizard? Um, no, no, lizard. So I'm thinking reptilian. Yeah. Uh, she wouldn't go in there, and every night I have to check behind the curtain. No, 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 lizard man. I can't. I, I can't say yes. She's seen things, um, but you know I, I don't stop it either, because unfortunately, as we all know, this is the world we actually live in. And again, that's why people come to us, because we are open to it. We have these experiences. We know what's going on. Same with yourself. People want somewhere they can talk to in a safe space. Because yeah. we are involved in the world that is true. Absolutely. Yeah, and the, with the stuff that's going on, like people uh, go, oh, where's the evidence? You go, we've laid out footprints for you. We've laid out uh, pictures for you. We've laid out thermal images for you. And on top of that, there is over, uh, I, don't, I don't know, what, 3,000, 1,000 reports on AYR of people of sound mind and uh, being saying, I saw this. Well, t- technically, it's more than that because there's that many emails yeah. and messages that come through Facebook. Yeah, um, that aren't they? They 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 don't want to get they they don't want to go go on file. Yep. They just want hey, I just want to let you know, uh, I got screamed at on the back of my property the other day. I just don't worry about. It. I just want to let you know. That's all. Yeah, on this area, I just want to let you know. Oh, so, and even more than that. Well, that's what I'm yeah. saying. Like, I mean, if, 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 if you've got 3,000 yeah, reports. Well, but I mean, when I'm saying more than that, I mean more than that sort of description, not just oh, being yeah, yelled sure. at, but there's, yeah. there's people who just 
they just don't want to be public with their story. And I get it. And then there's other people who are tripping over themselves trying to tell their story, including, you know, as I said before in our last show, uh, a lot of the Aboriginals now, they want to tell their story before it's watered down into nothing. Yep, absolutely. And on top of that, on the flip side of that, we also get people that come to us who are full of it. Oh, yeah. you heard me, full of it. Well, you know, they seem to think things happen. I mean, they believe it themselves. Though. I, they, they believe it themselves. They believe it themselves, but there was that one person in South Australia who thought that no one's heard of the Sierra Sounds. And they, <laughs> and they, they came to us with and claimed it was theirs. video two or sound recording two of the Sierra Sounds. 15 seconds onwards for about 12 seconds. Yeah. If no one's heard the Sierra sounds before, Google it. It's amazing. Ron Moorhead. Ron Sierra Moorhead. Sounds. Yeah. Listen to it. It's, it's. So yeah. this, this person comes to us with their quick 15 second clip of video two of the Sierra sounds claiming they recorded it in South Australia. Yeah. And because we, we, you know, we're, we, we're in the circle. Yeah. We know what the Sierra, Sierra sounds are. And we know Ron. Exactly. So to come to us and try and claim that as your own, and on top of that, do you remember the Chucka Bigfoot? So the the movie with Will Ferrell and um, oh, yeah. uh, Land, Land of the Lost. Yeah. And there was that Chucka, the Chucka um, um, ne- ne- Neanderthal. So there, there, there was, um, I think it was Georgia, Georgia in 2016, maybe I'm not too don't quote me on that. Uh, this white being coming down 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 a hill. It looks like Chucka from from Will Ferrell's movie. <laughs> You can you can Google uh, Chuck a Bigfoot on Google. It'll come up. Yeah, right. So that picture it coming down the hill. So this person in South Australia decided to send us this, this Sierra sounds. It's mine. I recorded that, and then sent us a photo of a Bigfoot that he that he captured. It's Chucker. Wow. So we 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 were an open gate for people to you know to be there for them. But on the flip side, we we do get these kind of people come to us as well. And and the thing is, I feel like you almost need to. Let these people know, like. Oh, he didn't you, like it. You, you're on. You, he didn't that's, like. It. That's a problem. Um, <laughs> because I'm the same. I'll have people who will send me images and and things like that. And first thing I'll do if anyone, this is a hot tip. Anyone who sends me an image, first thing I'm doing is thrown into reverse Google search. Yeah, yeah. Because that's just going to pull up every source that you, if you are trying to fool me, I'm going to find out. Yeah. That's the thing. Like, I think like some people think because we're in the circle, we'll we'll accept everything as Bigfoot yeah. Yowie. No, no, it doesn't work like that. We we have our own protocols to to rule things out before saying yeah, even yes. within ourselves. Correct, exactly we, right. Um, we've even become our own mystery. Uh, at uh, on one expedition for two hapless uh, the Germans. The Germans. Oh, I love this story. This is a hilarious. <laughs> story. Great. So this story will probably be retold in. Uh, yeah, well, I'll, 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 please uh, let yeah, me do the lead, lead up. up to it. So this was this is about. Oh, in fact, we haven't. There's another one that I need to tell you. <laughs> Which one first? The one that you tell whatever. Flip you want. a coin. Okay. All right. No, I'll do both. The the week after <laughs> the week after we got the buck got the footage, uh, we got the footage. Um, we. Buck. We we. <laughs> We'd, we'd all walk down to what we call the crossroads, which is down from base camp, and crossroads is just two dirt roads. And uh, myself and Gary had decided to turn Ooh, around and yes, walk sorry. back oh, yeah. Yeah, up this, to this base is good. camp. This is good. And it's night time. Well, well night time. Of course, it's night time. But I don't know what what, what time was it? Is I'm going to say eleven ish. Let, let's go ten thirty. It'll do. Ten thirty five. Seven. And uh, and so we start walking back to base camp to get a couple of camping stools that we could just pin to our backpacks. And Buck's back down with Shannon. Shannon. With yeah. Shannon. And he's watching us walk back to base camp in direct line of sight. With the thermal camera. With the thermal camera. And now Buck can tell you the story. Yes. Yeah, so um, Gary had explained to me uh, in uh, my further tuition in <laughs> – Gary University on thermal cameras, that if you have it on a, a black is hot setting, it's much easier to navigate the paths because across the paths, sometimes there are sticks, fronds, and you can trip on them and make a big noise and then you're giving away your position, which we don't want to do. So I thought I'll, I'll follow this advice and I'll just see what it's like navigating. I'll um, 
Uh, see if I can get some footage of Dean and Gary walking back to base camp to get some chairs. And uh, I've got them going back to base camp. And uh, there's a bit of footage. They go around a corner. And then uh, I've stopped recording. And then I'm just I'm just getting used to this new setting. And then I see this this uh, upright being. It looked like some person in a hoodie. Like it wasn't closed, but it was just a black shape because black is hot. And they cross uh, from left to right. Bipedal. Bipedal, hunched over, straightened a bush, and I'm on the radio. Uh, and this was a painful lesson for me. I'm going, hey, guys, uh, I, I, if you come back, and they go, no, we're, we're back at base camp. What's going on? You so, said, have, have, has any of you walked into the bush? Yeah. Um, but you asked us that at least four times. Yeah. I was, we couldn't work out why you keep asking the same question. Because uh, I'd seen a bipedal creature walk into the bush, and I didn't record because I wasn't expecting anything. I thought. Uh, guys have just gone up that way. Um, I'll uh, use this new setting, see what it's like for navigation. And it was hunched over and it went straight into the bush. The guys came back and uh, they – we all got our thermals out and we, we couldn't locate this creature. And it was a very painful lesson is, you know, shoot first – Ask questions later. It, the, the, the description that you gave me was very similar to the footage we showed earlier of that one behind the stump with that sort of that cloaked sort of head look. Yeah. Uh, but it, it came out, as you explained at the time, where it was sort of stooped. Uh, it was bipedal, and I think you said it was over six feet by. I, I, it was human as shape. An, as an it estimate. Didn't have a scope. At, at estimate, it was as big as Gary, but not Gary because you were with Gary. And Gary didn't go walking into the bush because Gary was right next to you and camp was a further 50, 60 metres up around the corner, the bend of that track. So, so it was either – was it the same night with the um, with the tourists? I think so. It no, was a, I think it no? was. Okay, so I'll, do, I'll just set this up. We had a, we had a base camp uh, again you know, was, sorry, be, be, was. between 11 uh, and midnight – and we'd all we, there's two groups of two. There was uh, Shannon and Gary, and there's myself and Buck. And uh, we had ventured away from uh, base camp, two different tracks. And myself and Buck, we were exploring this new area for the first time. And uh, so, you know, we were quite a ways away. And uh, we had our red torch lights on, our head, headlights on. In fact, I, I don't think I had mine on at all. And I think. At some stage, uh, Buck had turned his off, yeah. and we're just Buck. Had, Buck was on the other side of the track to me, and we're in total darkness, just listening to any sounds around us. And then suddenly, we could hear some voices. Yeah. Kidding voices, and then they started to sound like human voices. That's strange. Up Jeez, here, these yowies are getting close. I mean, this is yeah. kilometers and kilometers uphill, like up mountains at this time of night. How could it be human voices? So I've recoiled into the darkness and I've got down really low and I've, I've gone into I could now I could see a couple of lights and I've gone into a ball but right in the middle of thorns. So I've got all these thorns digging into my skin and I'm trying to be quiet and I couldn't move, couldn't move and I'm just oh, oh, oh. I was, oh, no, I can't move, I can't move. People are coming. And I knew Buck was on the other side of the track. And? Yeah, um, well, I had a thermal camera and I was just working this heat image and I'm going, what is that? Is that a head? Is that something? And then I went, oh, my God, I can see white light coming up the tracks. And here I'm thinking, oh, Buck's already seen the same as I and he's recoiled on his side and he's totally stealth, totally hidden. No, no, I was not totally hidden because uh, I was just taking into uh, account that, oh, Far East, these are the people you don't want to meet on the track. They're other researchers. The, <laughs> worst. the, first, the <laughs> first thing that crossed my mind, who would be out here, up here, in the middle of the night other than Yowie researchers? And, of course, I'm not night blind because I've just destroyed my night vision. 
I haven't got my lamp on uh, and I, I'm trying to get off the track but I'm just smashing myself into trees and eventually at some stage I give up because I just, I'm a wreck. I've banged my head. I've got some thorns sticking in my leg and these two headlights come up the uh, road and then they're great. This is what greets them. They, I'm in complete black. I have no light. Because that's not creepy. Not at all. That's not creepy. And I'm in the middle middle of nowhere. And uh, they're going, wow, we've come across the uh, not so slender man. (laughs) 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 And I I, I can't see them because I've got two. I've got two headlights in my face, and I hear some very, very disturbed voices going, "Oh, hello, (laughs) Uh, are you?" Okay, and I go, yes, and it's a complete lie, you know, I'm not okay. And they said, are you alone? And another complete lie, and I go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this is this poor- guy standing in the dark on the middle of the track, kilometers away from anywhere in the middle of the bush, and these are tourists. Yeah, this is Hansel and Gretel <laughs> that have met the big bad witch. On the, and they're getting a shock. This story's going to go back to the motherland. Anyway, the next question is, oh, do you have a light? And uh, I I did. And I said. He's in complete darkness. They're talking complete about dark, And I went, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, uh, then another question was like, "Are you okay?" Like, <laughs> and I can see that you know the jaws stiffening and the lips tightening. And I just imagine your pupils are like super dilated because it's so dark. Yeah, and you know when you're telling a lie to someone and you know that they know you're lying. That was what <laughs> yeah. was happening. And this poor woman and this poor guy, and they were Hansel and Gretel. They were togged up. Each had walking sticks in both hands. Wow. Hiking with camelbacks for their water. And they would have been coming up this hill for miles and miles and going, oh, Gretel, let's go for a good walk, you know. We will have the track to ourselves. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's what would get them. And um, they said as they sidled past me, Okay, good luck to you then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but can you can you under, can you just take it from their point of view? Like they they they've walked up this track, and Dean and I have walked this track. Yeah, Dean and I walked this track in the daytime, going down, and it was a big trip. Going down was was a, an ordeal. They they've come up at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night for some stupid reason, and then pitch darkness. And then run into him, dressed, <laughs> dressed in black. With but the no thing thought. is that their car would had to have been still down the hill. They never came back. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. They ju- I've got one. It was your fault. It was my fault. I did manage to get one frame of Hansel and Gretel leaving, uh, and they were hiking a good pace. And uh, then the next thing is I've got to find Dean. What's Dean done? He's I'll tell disappeared. You what was, I'll tell you what was a bit unnerving is that when they left – Buck and the ghost, because he, he, <laughs> he, 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 yeah. he was hiding. <laughs> and they've come in the trail that Shannon and I are on, and we're about a kilometre up that track, and Dean comes out of the radio going, you know, there's people possibly heading your direction. So we start walking back that way, and we we turn our white light on, which we don't do, but because it's too random people, we turn it on. We we cross paths. They said nothing. that They were hiking it. But they said nothing about the creepy guy. Yeah. <laughs> They just hi. No, no, no warnings about the guy further down no. the track. What if what if we were two precious women and they said nothing about him? You do have okay. long hair. <laughs> let's let's think broader here. <laughs> let's think broader. Oh, what no. if Buck wasn't the only person they ran into on that track? That's true. Yeah, we did discuss that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we were saying, well, you know, they don't even know where they're going. And we have hiked that the rest of that track going that way. It is a hell ride. Yeah, kilometers. Dangerous, 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 dangerous. And to get out to anywhere safely, um, you've got to know where you're going, what you're doing. Um, and so we're sort of thinking, well, are we going to find these guys in the in the front front page of the, the Gold Coast Bulletin yeah. uh, the next day saying missing uh, German hikers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, um, they, they were fit. I mean, 
you could tell that they've done this before. Well, but I can freak them out that much. They were not coming back <laughs> no, for anyone. No, they, <laughs> back to Germany. <laughs> They're back to Germany. But but boy, would they have a story to tell, though, right? Absolutely. <laughs> you you just made their Australia trip. Yeah. I, I, I put, everything can kill you in Australia. I put yeah. Wolf Creek and everything <laughs> into one <laughs> into one moment, and they were, we were lucky we got out alive. Uh, we, um, yeah, and then they would have embellished the story as well, you know. <laughs> And there were two people that we met on a. Oh he my chased goodness. us with knives. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the funny His thing, eyes glowed in the dark. The funny thing was when I finally encountered Dean after he, he came out full. You I, know, was Rambo, he I was not happy. I was not happy. Pulled the leaf litter off himself. And the prickles. And, and the prickles. And I found his heat signature again. He said, Who was the third person? You know, there were three people. I heard three voices. And then. Do, I don't talk like that, do I? Yeah. Yeah. No, I thought that was you talking there for a second. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, he was surprised. I said, no, no, that was me. And he went, what? You had a conversation with them? Uh, How did you get seen? (laughs) How did you get seen? Couldn't you see them from a mile away? What were you thinking? (laughs) Because he he just just stood in the middle of the track. He didn't go anywhere. He just stood in the middle of the track and dark. Then I was really worried that they were going to go through our base camp. And, um, yeah, and so we took off after them. We couldn't keep up. No, they were gone. And we saw their little lights going uh, in the distance. Well, guys, we've got about 20 minutes. 20 minutes left. Do you want to take some questions from the from the sure. viewers? Actually, I don't know how many people we've got watching us at the moment, but um, 109 people are watching us at the moment. So um, we'll give these guys a couple of minutes to, to gather themselves. Um, Keegan, the uh, producer for tonight, he's been doing a, uh, a bang-up job controlling yeah, the camera. Yeah, thanks, Keegan. Thanks, Keegan. Uh, all technical uh, faults are his problem. Uh, and and not mine. Oh, so that sound that wasn't working is totally Keegan. Yeah, <laughs> definitely yeah. not me. Um, so if we do see any questions that are um, worthwhile asking, we'll uh, we'll get them on the screen. Get Keegan and read them out to us, and um, we will uh, answer them as we go. Can I think. Mm, no, not at the. I I could, but it, I I might break the rest of the system if I do that. <laughs> Let's not do that. <laughs> what do we got there? Oh, hang on, Keegan. I'll give you the microphone while you ask yeah, the question. Yeah, yeah. So we have we have a question here, and it says, "Has the guys followed up on any Australian tiger stories?" Uh, Tasmanian Tiger had a sighting myself, Blue Mountains, 1998-99, right in front of me, camera in hand, uh, 11 o'clock at night. I love this 11 o'clock at night thing. That's when things happen. Um, didn't know what it was. I was green at the time. In fact, we were in 98, 97, 98. And uh, here is this thing I heard come through the bush, coming towards me. I was waiting for the big guy at the time, which we called Fatfoot. And uh, out comes this stupid-looking dog, uh, low to the ground, long snout, uh, rigid tail came out like so, and the stripes began on the back of the the shoulder blades, went right down, the, decreased, and then back up through the tail. And uh, I've th- seen this before, seen this before, and this thing's right in front of me. Uh, he had his nose to the ground, he's on the centre something, and he was not concerned about me whatsoever, as opposed to what the, the researchers say, oh, they're very timid, scared of people. This thing was not scared of me at all. He was too busy thinking about what he was what he's tracking. So here I am, camera in hand, finger on the button going, go away, go away, go away. I'm this is a $100,000 shot, mind you. <laughs> I'm going, go away. It wasn't until I got home that night or that morning at probably about four, o'clock, 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, I'd opened up um, Paul Cropper, Tony Healy's book, Out of the Shadows, and I've, I've gone, I've seen this thing before, flipped over to a full-page uh, um, uh, picture, and here it is, uh, thylacine, bam. And we also have a lot of people that contact us with their sightings, and uh, we do have a, a, a database on that, but it's something that, well, I got out of a long time ago after doing investigations and even a documentary on it um, uh, many years ago. But we know all the main players. So, I mean, we're friends with all the people in that field. So, yes, all these recent reports in the news about scientists trying to revamp the, the uh, thylacine, the Tasmanian tiger, there's no need to revamp them because they're still getting around. Questions, questions. One question for the guys. What do you think a yowie is? 
Oh, it's, it's an open-ended question. Personally, I think they're a type of people. Yeah, I, I think they're a, a flesh and blood creature that has some extracurricular <laughs> abilities. <laughs> extracurricular. <laughs> what, like so, play yeah. the violin? Maybe. <laughs> that type of extracurricular? Maybe, uh, maybe well, the, the, something like the, that. The thing is, why, I don't understand why people think that you can't have extraordinary abilities and not be flesh and blood. That doesn't yeah. make sense to me. Why? When we as human beings, we're flesh and blood, and then you go into, into the whole thing of the the, the third oh, the, the the penal gland. Yeah, I think we've, we've probably lost a lot of what we had many years ago because we don't need it because everything's fast in this world now. Fast food, fast television, fast entertainment, technology. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, technology. Um, so basically what I think, which I think makes sense, is that when, the, um, when Australia was connected via the Wallace line uh, to Indonesia and the rest of the world for that matter, this is where you know, the Aboriginals came all the way down through there uh, 100,000 years ago or so. 40,000 years ago, some people say, but nobody really knows. And the Aboriginals at some stage said, well, you know, these hominids were here first. Um, there, was some, there was a lot of breeding going on back in those days, like in, in, interbreeding, and the whole world was a melting pot of DNA. And uh, we get right into this, right into this, but it's a, it's, it's a big, big subject matter. What they are, I think, is what they are. They've come down through here. They've bred on their way as they have. DNA is manipulated, changed somewhat. But hominids, they are hominids, uh, not so much hominins as you'll get with a lot of the descriptions. So they are out there. They came down here, but they were landlocked. And here's the thing. They were landlocked when the waters rose, the Torres Strait turned into the Torres Strait Islands, Australia was landlocked. Whatever was here is now here. And they're out there surviving in the bush. I agree. <laughs> um, I uh, rest my case. Well, uh, it, what are they? I, I sometimes, I often ask myself that, uh, having got those thermals, which are, you know, I've wanted to recreate, um, seeing, having experienced what I had when I was young, um, and I do illustrations for AYR, and I listen to all the descriptions, and they just vary. They vary as much as people, you know, um, hairy beards, uh, stubble. Uh, uh, big like, noses, human -like. like human like um yeah but, i mean if, if you i mean if you have a look at the most common color you'll say well it's going to be burnt orange yeah and they're saying that gigantopithecus uh, that the closest relative is an orangutan right so where was the the closest fossil evidence of giganto indonesia and it wasn't that long ago when did the wallace line uh, or, or the Torres Strait close up only 7,000 years ago. Yeah, it could easily have made its way here. So that's one. But also remember that there's the interbreeding thing and there's a lot of different species of hominids and hominins mm. floating around all at the same time and they all could have come down during during that period and then been landlocked. And the Indigenous people say they are different types. There's two different types. There's I'm sure ones. there's even more than that. But, oh, they're, they're, agree, but, but the, yeah. the most common, obviously, as you're saying, is there's the large ones and the small ones. Yeah. yeah. Which I'm saying that we actually took a junjiri, so a small one, four to five foot tall. We took a junjiri report last week from wow. from the Gold Coast hinterland. Um, Cage I've, talking to himself. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I've got video of someone who believes they encountered a Junjiri. Um, I believe you guys probably have seen the the video as well, where it's uh, a, a group of people. Tree uh, climber. No, different, no. Different. So this is different. So this is a, a group of people. Uh, they seem to be hunting, uh, pigging, and um, yeah, I, it's I, the same I, one. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, and it kind of takes off across the. Yeah, but then something else climbs a tree. Oh, I didn't even see. I'll have to. You'll have to show us later. Yeah. Uh, Haven't you yeah. seen it? I'll have to shoot it Tricky. to you. Well, yeah. this, this one, the uh, the the witness was coming down the road late at night, about eleven o'clock at night, and doing about a hundred hundred k an hour. And he said he saw what he thought was a rabbit or a marsupial on the side of the road. So he's driving a performance car, so you know body kits, and that doesn't want to bust up his car, so he slowed right down, expecting, anticipating this object to run as they do so you see, you see slow down about 20k now had the high beams on next you know this rabbit stands up on two legs and legs it flat out across the road in front of him wow you see he just sat there for a second uh, uh, okay and then carried on his way you got another question there keegan 
Yeah, this is one is actually quite a good one. Um, it is. Do you think 1080 had has an impacted Yowie populations? 1080 being bait for dingoes and no. feral dogs. All right. Well, I, I, I think it's a good question, but pe- people don't give their intelligence enough credit. Um, you, can't, you, can't, you can't see them as the same terms as an animal. Yeah, micro- and this, mi- where, microphone, Dean. This, this is where people make a, the common mistake, or layman's do. You can't see them as an animal because they're not. Correct. Like they, from from the reports that we we take in, um, and our own experiences, there is no way that they are just some dumb animal uh, running around the bush. They are superiorly superiorly more. And, and if you have that sort of um, that mentality, you're not going to get anywhere as a researcher. But also too, if 1080 uh, if is put out for dogs, the the uh, the baits are small, and if a creature ate that, I don't think it would have much effect. If it was a stupid, I mean, it would know. It'd smell different, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, like they, well, their 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 senses would be so much more heightened than what and they would have we seen would dogs eating that and dying and going, ah, oh, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, yeah. No, no carbs for me. No takeaway tonight. Yeah. Are there any missing person cases where Yowie involvement is suspected? Yes, covered by Dean earlier. Yeah, we, we sort of covered that a little well. We, we glossed over it earlier. Uh, uh, there's a lot, and I, I can um, – <sighs> Yeah. Well, there, 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 there's some cases, even, even I, going back to missing 411, same sort of stuff. Yeah, but I, I sort of got involved with this at, at one stage uh, during my time and I went into, well, I, I made several phone calls and got transferred through, 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 through until I got to the uh, the real people at the end of the line. And because I'd, I'd worked so much on this and I got through to these people, they just automatically thought that I was from the Bureau. <laughs> so we, myself and, and this gentleman, had a long conversation, very lengthy one, about you know, missing people and, more importantly, how many were related to the bush. And it turned out the majority of the people, well, of course, of course, I mean, this is stating the obvious, the majority of the un- uh, un, um, unsolved crimes, the undiscovered people were all bush related. There's got to be a percentage in there somewhere. Well, I mean, okay. So, I mean, I've always said this before. You know, biological is biological. Animals are biological. Humans are biological. Humans kill humans. Kill, humans kill animals. Animals kill humans. Animals kill humans. Uh, animals kill each other and humans. So, that being reason and fact, what makes things these things any different if they're biological? Nothing. They'll flame. They'll have emotion just like anything else. And being opportunists, lone person, as I have been, um, and, you know, we will know my story. Uh, so, yeah, so it just makes total sense, absolute total sense that, yes, they are capable of killing people. And why wouldn't they be? I mean, it's a silly argument to say they're not. Well, yeah. I mean, as you said, you know, opportunistic. You know, if, if there's a rogue male who's just been kicked out of the troop or whatever like that, and he's got nothing like to do, yeah. <laughs> uh, nothing to do, um, has, has, a, has a pretty big chip in his shoulder. If he sees a innocent person who isn't built, just a frail, small, smaller person, um, quick meal. And the amount of people we found down the bottom of cliffs where it makes no sense, no reason, no rhyme, where the family all says, no, that, that is out of character. And they're so far away from a track or a trail that it makes no sense. Why did they venture away from the track and trail all that way through and end up – and I have other stories about this firsthand from people who were chased to that very point on the end of a cliff. And but that's a whole, so many different stories I can get into. But, yes, there's – Yes, I, do, I believe, I know I get very passionate about this. Uh, yes, they are definitely related to many, many missing people. And I don't care what anyone says <laughs> because you don't have the experience I do. Whereas I, I, I believe they'll just want to give me a cuddle if I, if I met them. 
Yeah, but and, that's, that's um, because Buck's lonely. So you can expect to see me on the back of a, a milk carton <laughs> anytime <laughs> soon. You know, I I I 100% think, uh, you know, Yowies would be connected to missing people. Um, you just have to think of the dumb decisions that people make. Uh, and and the thing is, I, I I don't think Yowies are adverse to dumb decisions, you know, especially young Yowies who are growing up. Running up for the cuts. Exactly. Well, even even when, even when we we get we have the reports of these beings carrying large dogs or large cows or you know a a human wouldn't be much of a lift. I mean we no. we, we even had um, a report from Austinville at the base of Springbrook. Or not a report. A um, we were told about this. So basically, there used to be a dairy farm down there, and every time the cows would come into calving season, uh, it, some would go missing. Well, not so much someone. Oh, yes, I guess so. Uh, but the farmer would go out with his shotgun because he'd be running down the paddock, uh, firing off shots of the shotgun. Because a yowie, as a calf is being born, yowie runs in, grabs it over the shoulder, wow, and run back off into the bush. Incredible. So, yeah, that, that was a, a dairy down there. Unreal. Keegan, and I've we heard um, similar things where a yowie has been actually spotted with a calf under the yeah, arm. Right? Yeah. Calves, yeah. dogs, kangaroos. Yeah. Um, we um, even took a report from the Pilliga where a, a horse was killed with a, with a stake right yeah. through it. Yeah. The stomach was ripped open and the only thing taken was the liver. Right. Most, most nutrient part. Yeah, absolutely. And that pig, uh, that pig. Uh, the pig that ripped, ripped in half. In half. Yep. Yeah, uh, and at Bathurst. And then the, 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 the same property with the horse. Yeah. Uh, he had incubators on his property with, ch- with chickens. Come home one day, the all, all, all the, the boxes are open, all the eggs are gone. Up the end of the paddock is a pile of eggs, and on that with that pile of eggs, each egg had a finger-sized hole punched in one end, and the contents gone. Wow! Yeah, yeah. Well, my- well Keegan, we uh, we have time for one more question, so uh, let's make it a doozy because we have reached the end of hour three already. So I'm happy. To, I'm happy to go for. <laughs> There is a question that has jumped up a few times, but it's just worded differently. Um, is bought for, from who? Uh, it's from Kel. Hey, Kel. Hey, Kel. Um, it's, it won't let me put it on screen. There we go. Oh, no, wrong one. It's Sorry, there Kel. There it is. Should, do you ever worry... A government agency will try to interfere with your research Ooh, and prohibit you from releasing information. Yes, yes. And also there was one about men in black. Yeah, okay, well, so even just... even just a quick one before Dean goes deep. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dean with, didn't know. With, uh, with um, the area of our research where Buck got his amazing thermals, uh, obviously we keep going back to these areas to continue our research. Uh, the local rangers decided to get the tractor out and clear the area only where the thermals were captured. I mean, on when, when you watch our, our expedition videos, uh, people known who know the area, which would be the rangers, who know certain tree stumps, burnt out trees, uh, would recognise it. But, yeah, the, 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 they, they decided to clear with their tractor. The only spot that they clear with their tractor is where Buck got the thermals, not before it, not after it. Um, and then again, that's before it goes full men in black, which is probably probably not a smart idea for Dean to talk about, to be honest with you. Uh, but yeah, 100% government knows about it. Um, we we have other files to do with Ulmo, uh, which proves that the government know about it, um, let alone other people coming around <laughs> with their encounters and sightings um, to not to – Put their their sightings and encounters public, like very, very out there sightings and encounters. And next, you know, there's government officials knocking on their door. Well, the, just um, while we're at it, uh, I remember when I was very early into the research stage, um, the uh, Katoomba Library had a list of ten frequently asked questions, and in the top ten was what is a yaoi. Uh, so for that's a government agency it's a level of government and for quite some time that was a top question it's not there anymore but um uh it made you wonder why in the blue mountains uh did you have that in the blue mountains library unless a lot of people were going what is it 
Which, you know, as we all know, the Blue Man's is a very high hotspot for activity. It's probably one of the most, I guess, active areas that I've featured on the podcast. It just seems to be this absolute hotbed of, of activity there. The most, prolific, the, most, the most prolific for the reason that uh, human inhabitants is uh, uh, but, but basically you know, it's, it's a large area of human inhabitants uh, in the middle of some of the most um, rugged mountain terrains and valleys surrounded by just vastness of wilderness that, you know, humans, a lot of humans haven't even stepped foot on. Yeah. Yet, yet you have that inhabitants, human inhabitants, and this is where you're going to find the majority or anywhere in Australia of the sightings is where the humans are backing on to this. yeah encroaching that area absolutely um so just for, just for those who are had a, had a keen eye dean and i just had a very quick conversation and <laughs> there may be a future episode about governments and yowies who knows let me know if that's something that you want is that future episode now the next hour because we'll go in yeah i know he, he's pushing us to do another hour i'm not I pushing for he another was. hour he was pushing he was. us to do he's hour begging. four you can see and, and look put this guy put it in the comments four. if you want hour four no, no, in the comments no. hour four is that the time no, okay. I, thank you, Kel. Our true believer. I don't even know it's going to last much longer. It almost died before oh, we where's, <laughs> where's, we, we, we where's the commitment? Where's the commitment? All right. We're, so, we're all going to get very loose if we're here for another four. Yeah, another round. Yeah, exactly. Chickens. Another four Chickens. Hours, I mean. we're, we're about to get into the Okay, so just so you know, myself so, and Buck are going to continue. Dean and Kate are going to bed. <laughs> yeah, they're setting up the hammocks in the corner. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep the... Uh, so anyway, so how you been? <laughs> I've been really good. You good? It's been a bit lonely uh, lately since Dean left the team to, <laughs> to yeah. join the Believe Crew. Yeah, look, guys, <laughs> it, uh, are they people actually want yeah. hour four? Look at this. They Gary want hour wants four. hour four. They want hour four. How many? <laughs> how many people are watching? Four. Hundred ten. You, you're going to deny one hundred and ten people hour four? Uh, people that's want a hour crime. four. <laughs> I'm in. Hey, we've we'll come all this that. way. Shit. How bleary eyed can we get? Hey, what, do we, what do we do? Let's just, just no, keep going. No, let's wrap it up. Dean, just, Dean's going to bed. Okay, well, Kate, let's pass my bed. Fucking eye stain. All right. <laughs> yeah, you just, know what? You know what? This put, is just put, put the camera just on those guys. Yeah, maybe. But you know what this is saying? We need a break. We need a break. Oh, let's shit. have a break. Another five and minute we'll discuss it. We'll, we'll have a we'll have a little discussion. Yeah, there's and no discussion. Yeah. The discussion continues. Just yeah, the the people have spoken. <laughs> <laughs> the people we're, have spoken. We're gonna hit. We're gonna hit the timer again. We're gonna come back in five, and uh, we'll give you an update on and, what's going and, to happen. Uh, Buck and Gary will be here for certain. <laughs> Only Buck and, and Gary. Uh, if you do want this to continue, and the Germans, Germans sleeping sleeping on the couch. in the you, have to, you will have there, to there share be, this live there, stream. There, there might be less lights and less pants. Five minutes.
Two shorts. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so it turns out we are going for a fourth hour. Uh, we're still waiting on Dean and Buck and Cade. I think they're having a quick nana nap. Uh, Buck's walking around with chips. Oh. <laughs> so, yes, I think this, this is happening. Uh, please keep sending through your questions. Happy to answer them. I wake up with angry yard coffee every day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this fourth hour is brought to you by Angry Yowie Coffee. Well, Jess has been asking about the golf game. Oh, oh yeah. Man. Oh, we need, to, we need Sarah for that one. Sarah's the one that takes the dogman reports for the most part. Um, but, yes, we do get them. Microphone, Dean. Yeah, are you microphone. in or are you out? Yeah, look. Um, drop it, drop it, then microphone. Drop yeah. it, chaser, microphone. Lick it, sip it, suck it. <laughs> did, he, did he buck say that's kind of weird? <laughs> I think like, I think this segment of the show is officially called Bigfoot and Beers. Bigfoot yeah, and Beers. Yeah. It's all going downhill from now. Yowies and yelling. So um okay, let's let's make a deal. Let's make a deal with the uh No, I will not kiss you. <laughs> yeah, I, I think he's talking about our five. Oh, yeah. oh five, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> if we drop below hundred viewers, yep. the stream's done. Oh, what are you done? We're done. What? Oh come no, on! Many, you set us up. That was a setup. That was a hustle. How many, how many viewers have we got? I suggested it. Um, okay, so we want to go into Dogman. Basically, uh, the Dogman enigma is, is really stepped up over the last five years or so. I mean, there's not a lot, but I think what we are seeing is something not that much different to um, what's been reported before. So if you go back like many, many years ago, like 100 years ago, et cetera, uh, you'll have reports of Yowies with long snouts. And the same thing was happening uh, in America. And we're thinking that, you know, this dogman thing and also what people report as werewolves uh, is probably just... Uh, a yeah, but how does that come back to the pointed uh, Doberman-like ears? Well, that's one thing I can't explain because, you know, in a lot of these these reports that we're receiving, the ears are more on the side of the head and they are quite upright like like uh, the Doberman. Like, like a Doberman. And what's the Egyptian? Um, Anubis. Anubis, si similar to the Anubis. Uh, now, one standout that we had here, and I'm just trying to bring up the image, is so Brisbane Waters, wasn't it? Brisbane Waters. I wish and, you told me about this. And a, a, a lot photo. of... A lot of people would have, would have seen this before. I'm just going to um, uh, just just this is this is all this is um, I wasn't re wasn't prepared for this. So it's been waters. Well, uh, while we he's looking for the image, we can talk a little Basically, bit about ears. There you go. So we bring out that up full screen. So the, the story behind this was there's a – I think he was what, – what country did he come from? He was Spanish. He was Spanish, wasn't he? And he was with his wife and I think the child was in the back and they're driving down through the Brisbane Water National Park. I think they're going down towards Woi Woi. And, yeah. uh, and suddenly out from the bush comes this creature and it starts right running beside the car. Now, I can't remember the exact details, but I think that uh, he said – well, I, I did my research uh, – a Hussein Bolt could run 47 kilometres an hour. Now, this thing was doing something in the vicinity of 60, keeping pace with the car, and they saw it. Now, if you have a close look at the snout on this, and this guy's a very talented artist, uh, as you can see, and uh, and Buck's done some great ones too. I can actually rip straight into um, Buck's images. But this thing's running right next to the car, keeping pace. Now, it's not the first time we've seen this happen in terms of creatures running beside cars or out in front of cars, etc. but keeping pace with cars. But I just think that's interesting, the fact that you've got this, these ears, you've got the snout, and it's a, and this is, he's done it himself, and he's, he's betrayed a very dog-like uh, yeah. face and snout. You know, it's it's funny. I, um, I've spoken to people. Not all of them have come on the podcast to, to share their stories, but I reckon I've spoken to probably about three people who have had encounters of dogmen chasing their cars. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that, that car chasing element does come up a fair bit, especially in the US as well. Yeah, yeah. It, like, that's, and to be honest, majority of the dog man encounters are from the US. Yes. Um, but it, it just seems like such a an odd characteristic. And to, the, to relate it to dogs, like, it's just, it seems like such canine behavior. Well, I mean, you've got things well, you know, the werewolf uh, phenom- ph- phenomenon, maybe the, the idea of werewolves in movies actually came from dogmen. Yeah. Well, yes, but, but, but I still Microphone, think- Dean, microphone. Yeah, yeah but <laughs> I don't know. I, I still think that they're, they're hominid related, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think they're, they're probably hominid. Um, werewolf, I don't think there's such things as a, a werewolf, a man turning into a wolf. I mean, I think that's just all. You know, well, if you take that back a couple hundred years, you know, when people, you know, thought the, the, the moon god and the sun god and they had to pray to the sun for it to rise every morning, if they see a dog man, then uh, maybe they it's too far outside their realm, which they would think it's a man turning into a wolf on a full moon. I, I think it's basically down to a hominid thing, which you know is, is global. It's worldwide. I um I put it down to a demonic thing. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, I um. A lot of people do. Yeah. So there was a tale back in the day when with um rye fields, um yeah, with it was like a side effects of a fungus in the field where ergot, ergot, ergot was, also known as Saint Helen's fire. Yeah, and it actually turned people to think they were werewolves and they would actually eat children. That's how like they'll hallucinate that they will actually. It was a psychotropic mold that yeah. um, affected their mind. Interesting. But I mean, even on saying that, you know, you, go, you talk about dog men, we even get reports of goat men, you know, as, as you've had yourself as well. Like, same sort of thing, a bipedal creature with the head of a goat. Yeah. Like, what? Like, it, it, it's hard trying to wrap your head. Well, it's not hard trying to, like, for us, it's not hard to wrap our heads around the hours because we've seen them. Uh, but then you've got dog men and then you've got goat men on top of that as well. Yeah. it's um, And then, you know, you go down the whole route of the Wendigo. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, you know, like yeah. this goat, yeah. deer, yeah. human hybrid type of thing. Yeah. And it's – the the world is such a crazy place. Like if if you imagine that 1% of the stories that were told were true and the, 90, the 99% were all bullshit, they're all lies and they just – They're all based on something. Yeah. But that 1%, if that 1% is true – that just absolutely changes everything. Correct. And and the paradigm has shifted to a whole other level. Correct. It's, you know, we're, um, as Graham Hancock says, we're, we're a civilization with mass memory loss. I think in, in the past, yeah. in, the, in, in the past, we've been a lot more open and we've had a lot more experiences and a lot more things have been known as common knowledge that uh, these days, um, it's, we, we've shut off to it. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're starting to turn that page over and go back to the other direction. Yeah, and I, I think technology is a, a major contributor to that because in, in, in yesteryear, technology wasn't our, our critical driver for advancement. Well, you, you, uh, you just look at the, the difference when with uh, Dean, Dean's, Dean's original flow to the, the cameras he's got now, uh, the advancements. He, he, said, he's, he has said... Many many times, even with Fatfoot playing play, play, play hide and seek and spotlight with Fatfoot, if if he if had, only yeah if, if if he had the, these guide cameras back then, Dean himself would have solved mystery long ago. Yeah, I, open and shut. Okay, here's here's a legitimate question. Twelve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You got a legitimate one now. A legitimate question. It's my only one for for tonight. Everyone, Cade has his pants on. He has a legitimate question. This it, this 12. is the only light. This might be the second live stream I've done where people can see uh, below the waist. So uh, I do wear pants <laughs> on these type of streams. Um, this time. So no, but the legitimate question is: Let's say you guys, you've done all the research, you've done all the hard work. Let's say. Dumb luck is in your favor. You spot it has a been in the first. Well, let's say you spot a Yowie on the floor, and the Yowie is hypothetically 
so startled it has a heart attack and it dies. The problem is they're never alone. There you go. Where there's one, you know the golden rule, there's another not far away, which is why you're not going to find a dead body. But what does that mean? Like, what? what let's say hypothetically this one was alone. Like, <laughs> okay. He was an outcast. Oh, hang on. I thought you were going to uh, ask a genuine question. But it there. is a genuine question. Like, what yeah, happens I, if you yeah. do find one? Like, what happens if I, I, I think, that, I think that's a tough one. I mean, it's, you know, for, for me, because I, I see him as, as more of a people as because opposed gonna, to an animal. Well, I, 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 know, to I, know what, I know what I'll because do. Because I know what will happen probably. I, yeah. I, I, would, I, would, um, yeah, I wouldn't leave it there by itself to rot or be picked apart by yeah. predators. I'll do the right thing and take it away and put it in the freezer. And live stream, uh, obviously, the, well, the, the he, situation needs you would live stream well, that he, moment he, right he, then. He'd he call me because I've got the ute because we wouldn't fit in yeah. the back of his car. Well, basically, be a lot of a lot of a lot of vindication for all these witnesses, and that's very important. And it's also important, uh, you know, for the safety of, of other people out there. It, it's knowledge. I mean, we need to know about these things. Yeah. The fact that they are out there, uh, it is so important for people to recognise that they are real. And, uh, and and the, the inherent uh, dangers yes. of, of them out there. Um, we need to know more about them. Uh, we don't know enough right now. Uh, too many questions and answers. And, yeah, yeah, I, I think it would be important because, I mean, if it's reality, it's reality. And if it's reality, then we should be putting the facts on the table. Simple as that. We, yeah. we, We're not out to kill one, but, you know, if we found yeah, one, well, yeah. Yeah, that's an opp yeah. opportunity. Um, Opportunistic uh, event. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that doesn't look like Dean, Dean said about you know safety for the for the general public. I mean, you know, there's there's the instance at, at uh, Tal Talabudra Valley down the coast in the Goldie, where a family moved into a house that had 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 no one living in the house for a little while, and I don't know, but let's let's just let's just say a rogue male um, had that as part of his territory. Now, now you got mum, dad, three kids, and the dog living in a house that was vacant for for a fair while. It's called a plovercade. <laughs> Sound like it was damn coming in the room. <laughs> strange events, high strangeness. We are um, in the haunted studio. But yeah, so I mean, like, yeah, yeah, situations like that where now there's mum, dad, three kids, uh, and the dog. And it got to the point where this thing would come down out, out of the hills every single day, scream at them. And at night, he'd go up on the, on, the, on the back patio, pick the dog bowl up, slam the, the dog bowl against the house. And it eventuated with the parents wouldn't let the kids be outside alone. Yeah, they, ended up moving, they ended up moving out of that house. Yeah, after 4 p.m. So in those instances, you've got a safety aspect. And then on the flip side of that, you've got where old Farmer Joe has owned 100 acres for 50 years. Mm. Never seen anything strange no. until. No, and then they, he, he goes and sells it to developers. And developers, as you know, they want to squeeze as many houses as they can in. So the dozers come in. Next thing you know, there's houses. There's 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 big boxes that these 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 hairless these hairless monkeys go and move into, and they bring in their loud music and their cars and the dogs and that kind of thing. When only a couple of months ago, that was this troop's front yard or their land room, and they were quite used to moving through these 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 yeah, lands. Yeah, that was no a very similar situation to I, I believe the Ormo mm. Yowie. Yeah, uh, the exactly one that caused right. so many problems over the period of you know six seven years. The one that tried to take me down, and he was an angry angry uh, individual. But, you know, I think, you know, the main thing is we have a lot of people come to us who say, you know, the government must know about this. They have to. Why aren't there signs up? I mean, that's the naivety of people, right? Why aren't there signs up warning people about it? This is the biggest shock they've had in their lives. They never see the Australian bush the same way again. Um, and it, it has an impact. It has a toll on many people. Some people are affected differently, sure, but some people don't deal with it very well. And, you know, luckily we're there. They can talk to people like us or Sarah. Um, and, you know, this is the question on their minds. So, you know, if it comes down to, yeah, if we find one, we're not going to do anything untoward, but if we find one, yeah, I think it's very important to actually prove it, that you know, these things are out there, and, uh, and let's investigate further. And let's get the funds. The funds are the main thing. Let's get the funds. And, uh, and guess what? The government will shut it down very, very quickly and, uh, and be mopped, uh, mopped away or, or swept under the carpet. One thing Too that, much to lose. I think one thing that people really overlook is the, um, the real-life implications of if these creatures 
got proven. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and it'd be an economic toll uh, on on our uh, on our finances. Um, you you see what happens when they classify a certain area for a bird, let alone. I, I don't like think the Australian Treasury would would appreciate it. I don't think Australian mining. I don't think yeah, mining. You've got mining, forestry. forestry they don't give a rat's ass because they just blow up. Um, you know, centuries old um, artworks. You, and you, things you'd like have that. two 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 separate sides of uh, society. Yeah, you'd have the tree hugging hippies wanting to preserve everything. Uh, we need to know more about these things because you know we we need to preserve the forest. No more logging. Okay, no more logging, no more mining, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have the other scale saying, hang on, we go camping out in forestry and there'll be the uh, the tourism sector saying, oh, my God, you know, are these things a danger to our children, to us? Um, is it safe for us to go out there? We don't know enough about them. Then you have the other side of the coin going, you know, there's three sides of coins, um, saying that, you know, we've got to change the history books as well, which is a real pain in the butt. They don't want to have to do all that. And that, and that's just a small token of you know what would go on. Oh, absolutely. The public hysteria is what people what, what the government doesn't want. Public hysteria is quell the masses. Mm. We don't want hysteria. Look, I don't want to like ban our Facebook pages, but if the big C has taught us anything, is that a change to the the, the smallest change to the world view has massive ripple effects. Ripple effects, exactly. So, I mean, you know, I was just getting on the outside. Could you imagine the real ramifications? Oh, my God. But um, while we're talking about this, real species, even uh, brand-new primates are being discovered. Like earlier this uh, year, there was a brand-new giant langur discovered in, uh, I think it was Vietnam, in a, well, a volcanic Silverback crater. was only 100 years ago, for gosh sakes. Yeah, Less that's than true. That, wasn't it? It was only 60 and um, uh, and just this week, they discovered an entirely new se- a new species of Galapagos tortoise. I thought, hang on, Pip, they're pretty slow, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> it's not like <laughs> it's not like oh, we couldn't catch it. Yeah, uh, it but was, they've discovered it was a brand. speedy boy. <laughs> yeah, speedy boy. Yeah, um, we got any questions up there? <laughs> yeah, I'll um, I'll, I'll uh, just go back to like where when, when I mentioned earlier, <laughs> let's say a few hours earlier, um, about yeah, a young girl, uh, fathers contacting us and they're young with their daughters. Um, something Kate said earlier, just I, I just thought I should probably actually tell that story. So, at the Sunshine Coast, um, some uh, a school trip pretty much went on. A school excursion to a national park, and they took their push bikes. <laughs> they, they, they took their push bikes, and the daughter she's she's about nine years old, and she rode ahead of the group. So, say say the class, she was on a push bike. She she rode ahead of the class on a bike. On a bike, yeah. On a bike on something bike. that you is a two wheeled thing. And um, a lot of children ride their bikes to school. They do. That's that's the type of bike that you're talking about. A right? push bike, yes, a pedaling push bike. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> oh, sorry, there, there's shenanigans going on here. Uh, yeah, so she she rode ahead of the class, and she come to a point where she thought she better stop and wait, and uh, wait for the class to catch up. And what happened was she looked to her side and she saw this giant giant being uh, poking his head around a tree. Uh, she, she saw everything except for, I think, its right leg. Uh, she, she saw the head. She saw the shoulders. She saw, she saw the arm. And this being was holding a tree branch down watching her. And then it let the tree branch grow, go and then it, it disappeared. Now, her father contacted us uh, that afternoon, I then sent him a message saying, here's my phone number, please call me if you wish to do so. And uh, this going back to a lot of the reason that AYR is here, why, why Dean started Australian Yerry Research, because the information wasn't there in the first place. I know, I wanted answers. Answers, exactly right. So 
her father contacted us. I sent him my number. He he called me and basically he he put me on the phone to his daughter, and she told me her story. Uh, literally, probably about two hours. Let's let, let, let's go to be safe. So, so three hours after it happened, told me her story, and the whole the whole point of this phone call was to let her know that she's not crazy. She's not seeing things. Uh, don't be scared. Don't be afraid. Don't don't feel ridiculed. Uh, don't don't feel like you are subjugated or you know pointed out from a crowd. Uh, the basically, I, I basically spoke to this young girl, and we had a good conversation. And basically, to say you know you aren't crazy, I've seen them too. And uh, sorry, I'm losing it a bit here. I'm sorry, I had a few drinks. So it's it's running that way. The uh, concentration is deterring to different directions. I think I th- it's not late. It's, 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 it's just not, it's late not late night. I think <laughs> you know the the thing is I think encounters from younger people. Uh, I feel like they would the, genuine, mo- the most pure. Yeah, exactly. Like they're they're pure and they hold a lot of weight. Um, when you were telling us earlier that your daughter. Where'd he go? The monkey? Yeah, like that That genuinely, that that hit home for me because it's like, what's going on around your property? You know, like, and, and for me, my mind will go like, what's the safety for my daughter? Oh, mate, um, I, I've, sat, I've sat in the back patio up in my place, like late at night, just sitting there in the darkness, walking the stars, and I've heard tree knocks down the yeah. back. And my, my place backs onto army land, and no one's going in there but army army personnel and yeah. guys. And up there as well, like it's it's as as Springbrook, you know, it's the same thing. A lot of people there know about it. I'm a Beachmont, the next Mount Naver. A lot of people there have have their own sightings and encounters. So it, it's another co- common thing. And of her tree knocks, the, the lady who who owned the, the owned the local shop, she hears them vocalise as they come up from the armyland to her place. And the typical thing of you know they've got hands, they can use their hands. Next, you know, a couple of chooks are gone, but they've got to unlatch the door. Yeah, well, that's to it. take the chooks, yep. put the latch back on, and then they head down the other side towards the dam and off toward towards Springbrook. This is a this is a left field question, but do you do you feel that Yowies would be very circumstantial in their in their opportunist uh, moments in the sense that? They would target women more than men. Well, there are stories of when women are in for their oil change. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, um, so basically there, there, there's certain you know when, when when women are in for their oil change, then activity picks up. And if you if you correlate that back to uh, traditional ind- indigenous tribes, both here and over in the US, um, of them stealing women. Um, to 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 mate with, right? Um, but yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I don't understand why. I mean, being opportunistic, taking the chance, yeah. Especially if if, if you're, a, you're you're a young male that's been kicked out of the troop, yeah. and you've got multiple troops, and you and you haven't had the chance to integrate into another troop yet, or to, or to find a female for yourself. Yeah, but um, in all honesty, like that, that's probably a risk out there. But most women will be worried about us yeah but I mean, look, that yeah. is true that is true i mean like there are times like look, i've always in, in my my experience about times where if it's one-on-one that yaoi is more active as soon as you enter another another person into that situation so it's a two-on-one situation yeah so for example out at mount Lindsay, which is where when when you and i spoke about my first encounter out at mount Lindsay, mm-hmm. episode 13 season one i think you're in, you you are a <laughs> Mate, You're I'm an a OG. I'm a founder of your group. Absolutely. <laughs> um, where my mate Way was up up the road a bit, checking that, checking out some sounds up there, and I decided to walk up towards him. And when I got close enough, uh, something massive took off up the hill, and I sort of took that as one on one. Wade's up there by himself. There's, there's no there's no immediate threat. You know, I've come up. It's now two on one. So even though that being could probably deck us both, um, the risk isn't worth the reward. Yeah. 
And and see, the reason I ask this question, and this is this is going into a, an episode, a guest who's been on my show, and I'm I'm not going to reveal like what episode it is or or anything like that. Episode thirteen, season one. <laughs> well, <laughs> but the uh, the the guest was a um a, a person transitioning uh, transitioning from a yeah. man to a woman, and because of this, there was a lot of there was a lot of uh, hormone therapy going. It's not buck going on, and uh, because of because of this, it the this this individual believed that the the imbalance in the chemicals that were inside their body because of the change that was happening um, was potentially leading towards more um, contact. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, in the sense that anytime that, um, she went out into the, the bush, she was almost having regular interactions with these, these creatures. Yeah. And that, that's a, that's an interesting point because it's come up often in the last 20 or so years. And it's a conversation I've had with Tony Healy many times, uh, people who have terminal illness, uh, as you will find out in our next witness audio report, and people who have like a, a major trauma in their lives, and therefore you've got an increase of energy and in whatever going on in your life. But yeah, I know exactly who you're referring to because uh, we've um, yeah we, we've had um, many many conversations. Well, Sarah has. Uh, yeah, so that that's interesting. Now, there's been a couple of messages on there. I was just up there reading uh, before. Uh, do we take women out? Well, we don't really. We, we get asked often whether we take people out. Yeah, it, it's got nothing to do with gender. Nothing at all to no. do with gender. It's just the fact that it's it's well, time, place, circumstance, and you know, location, proximity, uh, all that's got to be in place. And, Tr- and trust of character. Trust of character. Um, Karen Frost, uh, she says, "Can we send drinks to the studio?" <laughs> Karen's been really good. She's written up. They um, don't need any more. Karen's been great. Thank you, Karen, for <laughs> she's been writing up some reports for us uh, of late. I uh, really appreciate the work that you've done. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so at th- we're at um, ten thirty six now. Oh, look at time. them complaining already. Wow. We still we go yeah, for look, a fourth hour. I, I, think, well, I think it's probably time we, we wrap it up and say some I things so. for next time. Yeah, we're, definitely, we're definitely. At Twenty minutes. You tell me we can't push this out twenty minutes. I no, <laughs> 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 not tonight. Yes. But look, wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much for for making the trip up here. You know, this is this is obviously a very special occasion. Um, this is something that's never happened before. I feel like this is like a a, a very unique situation that has arisen um and i want to thank you guys for making that happen especially especially dean you know you have put together such an amazing team the what you have accomplished within the last 24 months has been astronomical and i believe has genuinely changed the the trajectory of what people are thinking about bigfoot sasquatch and the yowie I think, the, I think the most important thing that you touched on there, Cade, is team. And uh, you know, we leave our egos at the door. Uh, sometimes we press them. <laughs> we have a lot of fun with them. Um, no, we've just got a great band of brothers and uh, we love each other dearly, uh, which includes Sarah, obviously. Yeah, miss you, Sarah. You could Sarah, come out with us one day. There's, there's, As bait. There's, there's L and... Um, and Wade, Wade. Uh, Wade, Shannon. And Shannon, of Shannon. course, Shannon. And not only that, all your families who are so understanding of the endeavor that you're no participating it, in. It comes down to the individuals, and, and this is the, the whole team aspect of it, is that we have this unique team at the moment that we're really proud of, and you know, we all know our roles, and we all get along, and uh, like I said, like a band of brothers, we're in yeah. contact with each other every day. And, and to our lovely little nephew, uh, Jacob. Hey, <laughs> uh, Jacob. Well, the thing is, well, like you can't, you, you as Dan said, you've got to leave the egos at the door because when we are deep in the bush, um, doesn't matter who you are, 
you got to help each other get through. Oh, and you know, there, Gary's no, the master of that. I mean, no, he's, no, he's helped no, us all out no, of a fix no. so many we, times it's, over. It's a team effort. It's, yeah, okay. thing is, so I'll, I'll finish on one great Gary story. Um, then, then you can tell another story. This is just a real oh, He's, so he's, he's, he's trying to stream out this last 20 minutes, folks. No, um, Easy. We've just been hammered. We've done a, a massive, massive uh, hike out of uh, Numbamba Valley, and we were spent. We'd come up these hills, and Dean decided that he would uh, park the car and just look at this area. And below in this ravine was this car that had gone over the edge. And it was concerning because where we are, we only happened upon it. Dean saw it and un it looked fresh. And we had to know if there was anybody in there. So um, we sent the finder down uh, and halfway down. Well, he, well, I think he sent himself down. Yeah. And he was already. You couldn't stop he, him. He'd already helped me. And and, and cool. it, was like, it was like that on the Absolutely. way down. And there was grappling and we needed ropes and all sorts of stuff. Um, it, was, it was really dangerous getting down to this car and Gary went all the way down to make sure there was no one inside um, that needed help. And, and it was a long way, way down into this valley. And uh, the funniest thing about that was that while he just reached the car, we realised, oh, I could have sent the drone down. <laughs> I could have sent the drone down. But Gary, big hearted Gary, went down there, checked to see if anybody was in there. And people were right. And that's the nature of Gary. I mean, he just helps out so much on all these expeditions. Uh, he, he caters for all of us. You know, he sees us all falling down and he's just like, as I said, like he's a man mule. He's the ox. Uh, he, uh, and he's got a heart of gold and, and a big heart at that. Absolutely. I hate compliments. <laughs> You're blushing I, right now and I, it's fantastic. I, I, I feel very awkward with compliments already. I always have. I'm not. I don't go away. <laughs> okay, now he's saying cut the show. Yeah, cut the show. But no, no, but honestly, it, um, it, it is a team effort. I mean, we we don't go down there just for ourselves. We we do help each other. Um, yeah, the, the other good thing is we we laugh at each other. Yes, we laugh at ourselves. To, you and we laugh at each other. This. And um, and that's that's just a good character to have to be have that ability to laugh. And and with each other at each other and at ourselves. Mostly, well, you pull mostly the ticks and leeches off each other, and you know, going, oh, this bit of equipment's dead. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so let's um, let this wrap this one up. Let's wrap it up. So, guys, right. uh, thank you so much for uh, making the trip up here. It's very much appreciated. Uh, thank you to all the viewers who uh, have tuned in thank for the much. absolute mammoth. I got, God, I don't even know how long this has gone for. It feels like. Three hours and nearly, 42 minutes. Mm. You were robbed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, You're all uh, robbed. All robbed. All robbed. If three hours and 42 minutes was enough for you, uh, you need to check yourself before we you need wreck to yourself. Go for another 20 minutes, chickens. So uh, before I let you all shoot off, um, in case the uh, the viewers do not know, where is the best place to find you and contact you if they do want to share an experience? It's called yowiehunters.com and you can go to many different areas within there to find our witness audio reports or contact us, sub submit a, sub a sighting. And, of course, they have an amazing YouTube channel. You need to go check that out. And if you want to find out more about the Believe Podcast, head over to believepod.com. Uh, there is about 130-plus episodes ready for you to listen to for free if you like what you heard tonight. So, guys, again, thank you so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I feel like the night might be young for us going ahead. Shout out to Cade. Thanks. Thank you, Cade, for organising this big setup, uh, invite us, inviting us up here, organising his chauffeur, his minions over in the corner here. Yeah, thanks, Keegan. Press some buttons. Keegan. Keegan. Come in and say Keegan thank you. on Come buttons. In, Keegan. Yeah. Come in. Thank you. Come in. Thank you, Come Keegan. In. Thank you, Keegan. Thank you, Cade. There you go. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Shannon Wade Al. Thank you. <laughs> many, many words. Thank you yeah. so much, everyone. It's been a pleasure having you here tonight. If you've enjoyed the show, uh, be sure to share it wherever you share your uh, stuff. Your stuff. I, wherever you're watching this, because this is actually getting broadcast in so many different areas. Um, but be sure to uh, check us all out in all the different areas. So Make sure you. your cup is never full. We know nothing. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Good one. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>